Hey guys, welcome to my ultimate money making guide. In this guide, I will be going over 50 or more money making methods and I will be breaking them down between low, mid, high, AFK, and daily money making methods. I will have timestamps in the description for each method so you can just jump to whichever method interests you the most. Also, do note that a lot of these methods I have covered before in previous videos, and I'll basically just be editing them all into one ultimate money-making guide. Anyway guys, I hope you enjoy. Starting off with the first method, we have creating sacred oil. There is only one requirement for this method, which is the Shades of Morton quest. There are a few prerequisite requirements as well, but you definitely can complete all of these quests within the first few hours of playing the game. Now, recommended is also at least one Barrows Brother kill. This might take you a bit longer um, to complete if you are a brand new player. Otherwise, you might want to try and complete the In Aid of the Mire quest. This is just so you will have access to a bank nearby. Items that you will need is a flam tower hammer, olive oil, and a beast of burden. Do note that you can get all of these items in Morton, and also the Shades of Morton quest will be giving you a quick tutorial as to how this method works. So to start this method, you will want to begin at the PVM hub. I recommend having a melee gear setup or a mage gear setup. You can buy the flam tower hammer and the olive oil in Morton, so you can go ahead and get that a bit later on. And if you do have a Barros Brothers kill, um, you will teleport um, there pretty quickly just by using the uh, PVM hub teleport. So sacred oil it is done in the shades of Morton. You would have to do this um, For the quest so you should know how to do it already um, But I will go over that the first thing that you should do when you get here though is just definitely hop worlds Because as you can see not many people actually do this mini game, but if you do go to world 88 um, it is the Shades of Morton world, so you should be able to find some people doing it there. Um, if not, it can't really be done solo, um, so you will have to wait for someone. Um, but as you can see, it basically always is being done. So this mini game is pretty easy. Um, you're going to want to go over to the general shop first. You'll want to trade in the builder store. So for this, you're basically going to want to repair the temple with some materials before you can actually transmute your olive oil into sacred oil. So to do this, you're going to want to buy some swamp paste. Um, I believe mine's already pretty high, but normally you'll buy about 50 swamp paste. Um, and then you'll want to buy uh, one temper beam for each five swamp paste. And since I have 10, I'll buy two of those. Um, and then you also want to buy two limestone bricks. So if I do this, um, I'll also want to just trade in the general store, buy the olive oil th dose threes, and um, then we can head up to the temple to start gaining the sanctity, which you then use to turn the olive oil into sacred oil. So first off, just reinforce the temple. Um, as you can see, the resource part, you will be using these resources in your inventory and the resources will increase. You will need to have at least some level of resource so you can actually um, do this. So make sure that you do buy some of those resources at the start of the mini game. Um, another way to get some pretty quick sanctity is by killing the shades. So if you do have um, a high level combat level or even a mid level combat level since they are only, are only level 58, um, you will be able to get a little bit more sanctity per hour. Um, also, if there are other people killing them, that sometimes does happen. Um, otherwise, you'll just have to repair the temple. So if you do repair the temple, you will gain a little bit of crafting XP. And it is really AFK. You can just sit there, repair the temple, and you'll be slowly gaining the sanctity. Once you reach about 100 sanctity, you'll want to uh, then sanctify by clicking on the flame on the flaming altar. And you'll turn this olive oil into sacred oil. Um, so as you can see, the olive oil, um, those threes, they're priced at about 600 GP if you do turn it into the sacred oil. And so right now, the sacred oil dose threes are priced at around 12k each. 
So you will be able to make a ton of money off of this. The olive oil dose threes are only around 700 GP, meaning that you should be able to make anywhere around 10 mil per hour if you can make you know, around a thousand of these every hour, which definitely is possible depending on how fast you are able to kill these shades in the Beast of Burdens. But even if you do have a very low combat level, you still can do this method fully skilling and make some pretty easy GP per hour as a beginner player. So next we have casting bones to bananas. The only requirement is level 15 magic, and this method can be done in free to play. So for the method, you're going to want to make sure that you have some nature runes, some earth runes, and then the rest of your inventory filled with big bones. You'll also want the staff of water. You can use the mud battle staff if you are a member, and this will save you from having to bring the earth runes, thus also increasing the profit per hour. Um, but uh, for it, you're going to want to make sure that you do set a preset, preferably on preset number one. That's because you can just hit number one on your keyboard and you'll automatically load the preset. Um, so make sure you do overwrite that and just save that preset so you can load it pretty fast. Now, the other thing that I recommend is you're gonna wanna be right next to a banker um, and you can actually move your uh, magic uh, interface um, so you can put the casting bones to banana spell right next to the banker so you don't really have to move your mouse, um, just very slightly. So for example, I'll click on the banker, click my preset one, then cast bones to bananas. It does the entire inventory, making it really fast. So you can click the banker again, just rapidly do this over and over, and you are going to be making some pretty good GP per hour while also gaining some magic XP. Um, the GP per hour is right around three mil, however, it can increase depending on how fast you are doing this method. Um, but overall, I think it is a pretty good way of doing it um, and it's a nice uh, free to play money making method just so you can make some money in the early uh, levels of the game. The next low level money maker is killing chickens and you'll be able to make around 1.5 mil per hour. This method doesn't have any requirements so it can be done as soon as you start the game. It does help to have AoE magic abilities like dragon breath so level 5 magic is recommended which doesn't take too long to get now there is one really important thing that you do need for this method you're going to want to go into your settings um, into gameplay um, then if you go into item drops um, you'll see the area loot so you will want to make sure that this is on so make sure it has a check mark there that way when you do try and pick up an item you'll actually get this area loot interface you'll be able to pick up all the items around it so it just makes the looting a lot faster. Um, and this is what you're going to be selling. So all of these uh, items that you are going to be collecting, they aren't worth too much, um, but you will make about one mil per hour selling them all because um, you can kill a lot of these chickens per hour. Um, the XP per hour is also not really great, but it is good for a brand new account. So you should get, you know, to around level 20 or 30 magic um, in one hour of killing these chickens. Also, I do highly recommend you guys using a Staff of Air. They can be bought just for a few thousand coins on the Grand Exchange. Um, and Magic seems to be the best way of doing it since you will unlock the Dragon Breath ability at level 5 Magic. Um, and it will hit multiple chickens at once. So um, you will be able to kill a little bit more per hour using Magic as opposed to Melee or Ranged. Um, and then also when you do have a full inventory you can just go over here to the bank to deposit it all and then later you can head up to the Grand Exchange to sell all of your loot. So this next method is going to be smelting rune bars. This is also a free to play method however it can be enhanced if you are a member um, but on free to play you'll make right around 2 mil profit per hour whereas uh, member it'll be a bit more AFK and you should make um, around 3 mil per hour. So, um, for example, the member items that I do have, they are the Smelting Gauntlets, as well as the Modified Blacksmith's Helmet. Um, so if you do have these and you are a member, you can use them. Otherwise, don't worry about any of the equipment. All you're going to need is the Runite Ore and the Luminite. Um, so you will want to deposit it into your metal bank at the furnace. Now, when you do smelt these rune bars, 
um, you will get an extra 10% chance to smelt an additional one and that is at level 57 smithing so that is why that is a requirement um, you'll get a 10% chance to make an extra room bar which is going to really increase your profit um, as you can see since I do have these smelting gauntlets I will be able to make 60 of them um, at a time and they will go straight to the bank um, however if I was to remove the smelting gauntlets so if I was just on a free to play um, account um, you can see that you can only do 27 and they go straight to your inventory so it is a little bit less AFK if you are a free to play player but it still is a pretty profitable method um, also if you are a member you'll be able to make 3 mil per hour because you will actually um, be able to increase uh, the amount of room bars you make um, by using the super heat form uh, curse um, this will basically make it so you can uh, smelt these a lot faster um, meaning you'll be able to make uh, 3,000 of them instead of 2,000 of them per hour so if you do have that on a member world make sure you are using it uh, but otherwise for a free to play player it is pretty basic um, you're just going to need the ores and then you're just going to smelt the bars when you have the full inventory just deposit them all into the metal bank and then you can just start smelting some more so again it is an AFK method but uh, just not as AFK on a free to play world the next low level money maker we have is making teleport tablets and specifically the Sophenum Slayer Dungeon teleport tablets. So there are only two requirements for the construction and the Jack of Spades quest and the AFK time on this is actually about 1.5 minutes so yes it is a low level money maker but it is also AFK as well which is really nice. Now you will be making around 3 to 3.5 mil per hour doing this method. Now this method is extremely simple. You will be making these teleport tablets with the use of the lectern in your player owned house. So you will need soft clay and the law runes to make them. So the Menaphos, um teleport tablets for the Soften M Cell Slayer dungeon, um, they do sell for around 4,800. And as you can see, it takes two law runes. The law runes cost about 400 GP each and then one soft clay for about 900 GP. So you're making them for approximately 1.7K, so basically 3K profit per teleport tab. Um, you can make 26 of them at a time, and it takes about 90 seconds to do this. Now, when you do run out of soft clay, if you do have a butler in your player own house, you can get him to fetch the soft clay for you. That way you don't have to go bank and then teleport back to your player own house. So this method is really AFK, that is basically all you have to do for it, and you'll make around 3 mil per hour doing that. And so moving on to the next beginner money making method, we have fighting the giant mimic on beginner mode. So there isn't any requirements for this method, and recommended is 30 plus combat. As you guys can see in the bottom right, that is my gear setup, so I am using full Bandos and Ceredomen Godsword. So it is some fairly decent armor, but definitely not too high level at all. And if you are a lower combat level, you still could kill this boss and make some decent money. So the giant mimic on beginner, you can get to this boss by using a mimic token, which can be purchased on the Grand Exchange. Basically, you will want to teleport to the boss and select the beginner mode. The boss only has two different mechanics in beginner mode. One, it will charge at you at times. You will see some green arrows flashing on the floor. For this mechanic, you just need to get out of the way. Its second mechanic is a coin launch, and basically it will shoot coins around at you. You just want to move before the coin hits. Otherwise, it will deal quite a bit of damage. So those are the only two mechanics you really need to watch out for. If you do have a decent combat level and some decent gear, you should be able to kill this boss fairly quickly and collect its reward. Now you will be getting a what's called a small loot chest from this boss. The small loot chest does have some pretty low level rewards, but it also does have two uncommon drops, which are quite expensive. So it drops the Scrimshaw of Aggression and the Scrimshaw of Sacrifice. The Scrimshaw of Aggression is priced at nearly 1.2 mil, and the Scrimshaw of Sacrifice is about 1.4 mil. 
So obviously you are going to be making a ton of money off of this boss, around 6 mil per hour for a beginner player, um, just from these two drops. Now moving on to the next low level money making method, we have stealing cave goblin wire. The only requirement for this is death to the Dorgashan quest, and recommended is also to bring some magic note paper so you can note the cave goblin wire. You should be able to make around 2.5 mil per hour at current prices. So this method is pretty simple. You want to go to the south of Dorgashan, and you'll see that you can steal the cave goblin wire um, just right next to this machine. It does sell for about 7k each. And the wire does respawn every 6 seconds or so. So you should be able to get a full inventory in about 5 minutes. You can either then go to the bank and bank them. Or you can just use your magic note paper and just keep on doing the method. Another tip for this method is you can actually do, um, you can high out some items while you're waiting for the cave goblin wire to respawn. This will basically just increase your GP per hour slightly. So now looking at the requirements and recommendations for this money making method, first off required is making history quests. So you do need that quest completed along with the meeting history quest. And then once you have these two quests completed, you can complete the enchanted key mini quest. Basically there is going to be 22 different locations that you will need to gather treasure from using the enchanted key. It actually does take a little bit of time to complete this mini quest, but once it is completed, you can then go ahead and get the Zamorak Milnors. As for the recommended items, you will want the Clan Vexillum. This allows you to teleport to the Clan Camp, which is going to be a step towards getting the Zamorak Milner. A Ring of Dueling is really helpful as well. You can buy them on the Grand Exchange. You'll be able to teleport to Het's Oasis using the Ring of Dueling, which is where you will get the Zamorak Molners. The Archaeology Journal is also pretty helpful. It will teleport you to the first location where you will be able to get the Guthics Molner. And of course, Bladed Dive and Double Surge are helpful since it will allow you to move around a little bit faster and complete these runs just a little bit quicker. Now, the Zamorak Molners, you're probably wondering why they are worth so much money. Right now, they're listed at over 300k on the Grand Exchange and selling for right around 280k. Now, they are worth so much because, as you can see, they have a 1 in 4 chance at disassembling into Zamorak components. If you don't know, Zamorak components are highly valuable. They're used to get perks like devoted, impatient, and imp souls. So it is a really valuable component for a lot of players, which is why the Zamorak Molners have a pretty high value. Now, as for the gear setup, as you can see, I am using full archeology span outfit. It isn't really needed, but it will allow you to teleport to the archeology span campus, just like the archeology span journal. Uh, the key essential items is that clan Vaxillum, uh, the Traveler's Necklace, the Ring of Dueling, and of course the Archaeology Journal. You will want to have both a man hand and an off hand equipped so you can use Bladed Dive as well. And in the inventory you will want some spare Rings of Dueling, Traveler's Necklace. You can also bring some Acceleration Power Bursts. This will allow you to refresh the Surge cooldown whenever you need it. And then also just bring a spade, some magic note paper, and you can bring a noted Zamorak Molner if you want. As you can see, I tried out this method and I was able to sell these Zamorak Molners for 280k each by insta-selling. So you can see that you will make a lot of profit per hour since you're going to be able to get around 50 to 60 of these per hour. Now in terms of the steps, you probably are aware of how it works, especially if you have completed the Enchanted Key mini quest. But step one is going to be to talk to Joral at the outpost. You can teleport to the outpost using the Traveler's Necklace. Now you will want to make sure that you drop all of your Molners before talking to Joral. Um, this will allow you to enable the chat options. So if you drop them and talk to them, you will be able to select the option two and then one and that will get you the enchanted key so you can go hunt for more. Step two is to dig for the Guthix Molner. 
Now here you will want to teleport to the archaeology campus. Now to get here, it is a little bit of a run, so you will want to use Surge. There is an ideal spot to use it, which you will see when I go through a walkthrough of this method. And you'll want to dig under the tree in this picture. This is where you will get the Guthix Molnar, so you can move on to the next step. You can drop or disassemble the Guthix Molnar, since it is worthless basically, and you will need to drop it at some point or get rid of it to get a new enchanted key. Step three is collecting the Ceridomen Molnar. So after you get that Guthix Molnar, you can use the Clan Vaxillum to teleport to the Clan Camp. Now you can disassemble or drop the Ceridomen Molnar as well. It will give you the Ceridomen components, so I do recommend disassembling it. Um, and as you can see, I have circled it on red where you will want to dig. And I'll be showing you in the walkthrough as well. Now, step number four is going to be getting the Zamrock Molnar. Things to know, you will want to use the Ring of Dueling to teleport to the Hats Oasis. From here, you can run a little bit northwest to the circle on screen. Um, as you can see, you will be able to get the Zamrock Molnar here by digging in this location. And then you can use the Magic Notepaper on that to note it. And then you can move on to the final step, which is basically just to repeat all of them. So again, drop the Molners and talk to Joral. You will be able to select the option two, then one, and you will get the enchanted key back again to repeat all of these steps. So now I'll go through a quick walkthrough just to show you each step actually in game. So first step is to drop the molars that you have and talk to Joral, select the option two, then one. Then you'll teleport to the archaeology campus using your archaeology journal and go to the next dig location, which is right next to this tree here. Um, then you can dig. You can also put the spade on your action bar that way. You can dig just using a keybind as well. The next step is going to the clan camp using the clan Vexilum and digging in the location right here. So that will get you the Guthix and the Ceridomen Molnar. The next step is going to get the Zamorak Molnar, which is right next to the Summoning Obelisk. Um, so you can dig here and you'll get that one. Then again, you can go back to the outpost. You'll need to drop your Molners, and then you can talk to Joral again and select the option two and one and get the enchanted key. So you will just want to repeat this over and over and keep on collecting these Zamorak Molners. If you are really efficient with it, you can get about one Zamorak Molner every minute or so. Um, for me personally, it took more like a minute 10 to a minute 15 but again I wasn't focusing my full attention on it and if you really did you probably could do it a bit faster but just to play it safe let's say you are able to get about 45 of these per hour and I insta sold them for about 280k so that would make it about 12.6 mil per hour if you were able to do a, a bit faster and get 50 of them per hour that would be about 14 mil and of course the faster you get them the more gp per hour it would be so as you can see this method is an exceptional money making method you can easily get over 10 mil per hour doing it and there are very little requirements only a few quests and a mini quest which also don't have too many prerequisites Moving on to this next method, we have going through the Anachronia Agility course. So the requirements for this method include 85 Agility. You'll need this to get through the entire Agility course. Also recommended is 30 Magic, Bladed Dive, Double Surge, and the Mobile Perk, just so you can get through the Agility course a bit quicker. The Agility Cape, which does require 99 Agility, is also helpful, since it will make it so you won't fail any obstacles. Now, you will require 750 of the codex pages to make one of these codexes. You can make an untradeable version for the 500 codex pages, but you can only use yourself. However, the 750 ones, the tradable ones, they can be traded on the Grand Exchange for around 50 to 60 mil right now. This method is quite simple. You're just going to be going through the agility course. You can go through either end. 
It sometimes is a bit difficult to see the obstacles within the Anachronia Agility course. So just one tip that I have for you guys is try and look for the white markings. You can see some white handprints or white footprints um, sometimes wherever you're going. But you might get lost if you're not um, fully aware of the Agility course. It might take you a few runs through for you to become really efficient with it just because it is sort of blends in with the rest of the environment. Um, but that being said, that's all of the, this method is, is just going through this agility course, getting the codex pages. So then you can make the codex, um, which does sell for 50 to 60 mil. And it should take you around nine hours to complete one of these codexes. And moving on to our next method, we have killing the Shadow Reef mobs. This is a pretty low to mid-level method. Um, you can make around 5 mil per hour doing it, and you get a ton of combat XP as well, upwards of 1 mil combat XP per hour. The requirements for this method include 80 plus combat, as well as 43 prayer for protect from melee. You'll basically need this at least when you are doing this method. And also recommended is Curse of the Black Stone quest. This is a really helpful quest since it will reduce the damage you take in all elite dungeons by 10%. So to start this method, head to Damonheim to go into Elite Dungeon 3, the Shadow Reef. You'll want to start by making sure that the chest picks up all of the drops for you. Um, I recommend using either Melee or Magic, whichever one you're best with. Um, and then you're just going to be going through the dungeon, killing all of the mobs. Um, the only mobs you don't have to kill are the Deep Horrors. They are pretty tough to kill, um, so it's recommended just to run by those. The Deep Horrors are located just right here. Just make sure that you run right by them and just continue on um, going through the dungeon until you reach the first boss. Once you do this, you'll want to restart and kill all the mobs over again. Going through these dungeons will make you around 5 mil per hour just by claiming the loot from the chest. Now moving on to our next method, we have killing abyssal demons. So the only requirement for this method is 85 slayer, however there are quite a few recommendations to optimize this method. First off, 80 plus melee or magic is highly recommended. Um, you'll want curses and overloads. Now if you are using magic, which is the best combat style to use here, um, Greater Chain is an especially useful ability here. You'll be able to get up to 1500 kills per hour if you do have this ability. Also the Inquisitor Staff works as well if you do want to boost your damage a little bit more. And the Scavenging Perk is an excellent perk to use as well since you will be getting a lot of kills per hour. And then also if you do have the Death Note Relic, that will be pretty useful here just to increase your GP per hour because it will note all of the uh, ashes that are dropped by these um, abyssal demons so you'll be able to pick those up and that will add a lot of profit per hour to this method so the death note relic is a really great relic to use here now you can make around five mil per hour doing this method and that is not counting the extra money you're going to be making from the components if you do have the scavenging perk um, and you will be able to be AFK for around two to three minutes at a time. It is a pretty safe combat method to do. So first off, when you get to the Slayer Tower, you'll want to pick up a Slayer contract for killing Abyssal Demons. This just adds a little bit of Slayer XP as well as some coins to your uh, profit or your time here. Um, you get to claim it for about 250,000 coins, so it is a nice thing to pick up, and you only need to kill 200 to claim the contract. Now, the best spot to kill the Abyssal Demons is at the top floor of the Slayer Tower. Um, hopefully, there's no one here. If not, you will have to hop worlds. Um, but uh, first off, you're just going to want to use your Aggression Potion and your Holy Overload. Make sure that your action bar is set so you do have a lot of AoE abilities. So you will want Corruption Blast, you'll want Chains, and Dragon Breath. Um, if you do have that Greater Chains ability, as I mentioned, that's going to be the best ability to use here. So you'll want that to be active as often as possible. So doing this method, you can get up to 1,000 kills per hour. If you do have the Greater Chains ability, however, um, you can get much more than that. You can get up to 1,500, especially if you do have the Chroming perk along with that. 
Um, so this method does depend on a few things if you're looking to make extra profit, um, but on average you should make around four to five mil per hour um, without optimizing this method. So starting off with our first method, we have hunting igneous jadinkos. Now these are located on Anacronia and you're gonna want to be hunting them for their marble vines, which are then used to make juju farming potions. So they are in demand, um, and you are going to be making a pretty good profit on them. They're about 10k profit per vine, and they are stackable, so it makes it so you don't have to go bank. Um, so this method is really great. Um, the requirements are level 74 hunter and 64 herb lore, so not really too high of requirements. This is the method where you could probably complete it if you were sort of a mid-level player. But also recommended is the trapper outfit and 71 summoning. The trapper outfit does require level 80 hunter, so it is a bit of a higher requirement. Um, and also, the Igneous Jodinkos will be able to make you right around 8 mil per hour, depending on how fast you are with it, and if you have the Trapper Outfit or not. The Igneous Jodinkos are located on Anachronia. You can go to the Anachronia base camp, and then just north of there um, will be the Igneous Jodinkos. You are going to be catching them using the Marasama plants. You're going to want 5 of them if you do have 99 Hunter, that way you will be able to catch them most efficiently. Also an arctic bear familiar is helpful. It will give you a plus seven invisible boost to hunter and scentless potions are also really helpful when you are doing this as well. Um, but basically you are just going to be staying here and catching the igneous uh, jadinkos until you have enough. So if you do it for about an hour, you should be able to get around four or five hundred of these um, and as I mentioned, the marble vines, they are stackable. So you can stay here for however long you want to get as many of these. Um, and then when you are done, I'm going to show you guys how you can make the potions for the actual profit. Now, along with the potions, you are also going to have a chance at getting some seeds. Um, so the Ignis Jodinkos will be offering a variety of different seeds as rewards. Um, one of them being the grapevine seeds, they are worth quite a bit, so you will make a few hundred K off of that every hour. Um, but another spot where you are going to be making quite a bit of money is from the actual Igneous Jadinko unchecked animal for the player owned farm. You do have a 1 in 500 chance at getting these, so you should expect to get one every hour or so. And they do cost around 5 mil, so that is a big chunk of change that you are going to be getting from this. Um, and then not to mention, you are going to be getting that consistent profit with the marble vine as well. Now, once you have caught enough of these Jodinkos and you're ready to make the potions, you will want to buy some Yugyun unfinished potions. Um, so you are going to be mixing the marble vines with these potions to make the Juju farming potions. Um, I do recommend you guys do it on a portable well. You can use your own or just check the portables discord or Port portables friends chat to find a well it will allow you to have a chance at doubling the potion so it is really helpful also if you do have a uh, botanist necklace this will give you a chance to turn the potion into a four dose instead of a three dose increasing your profit there as well um, so just use those few boosts when you are making these potions just to optimize your profit um, but then you're just going to go ahead and make them, um, and you'll see that you are going to be getting a lot of profit from these. So from these vines, I was able to make 36 potions, five of them being four doses. And as you can see, I bought the potions for right around 360k or so, and then I made about over one mil. Um, so you can say I made right around 650 to 700k profit from this. And this only took me five or six minutes to complete. So you can see how you can get the eight mil per hour doing this. I wasn't using the trapper outfit so I because I don't have it. So that, of course, will increase your GP per hour. But this is an awesome method. Um, and then including that uh, igneous Jodinko, um unchecked animal that you could get, the profit per hour is exceptional. And moving on to our next method, we have fighting elves. The requirements for this method is 85 Slayer as well as Plague's End, so you will unlock Priftiness. Now recommended is a Noxious Scythe, you will want that Halberd type range, 
Um, Soul Split is extremely helpful as well as Overloads and the Spring Cleaner since they do drop a ton of uh, alkables. Now the GP per hour that you can expect is right around 5 mil per hour and for this you will want some Overloads as well as some Aggression Potions, um, some Magic Note Paper as well just in case you do get some drops that aren't noted um, which they do drop occasionally. Uh, and also for the gear setup, you can see that I am using the Noxious Scythe along with my Masterwork Armor, um, Cinderbane since they can be poisoned, and the Amulet of Souls. Um, for this, you can use the Penance Aura or the Vampirism Aura. The thing with Elves is they do hit quite hard, especially if you do have a few of them on you. They do have some Bleed Special Attacks, which will hit really hard, so you do need to be cautious with that when fighting them. Um, so uh, it does depend on the player's combat level and gear that they are using, but you can use the Penance Aura to make it a bit more AFK if you have fewer elves on you. Alternatively, to make it a bit safer, you can use that Vampirism Aura. So the elves or the Iowerth Scouts, they are located in Priftness. You can find them just about everywhere. Um, however, I like finding them in the southwest portion of Priftness. And you will want to basically just attack a few of them and get them to aggro onto you um, and then find a nice corner to sit in and use your AoE abilities on them. Um, the thing with elves is they don't actually die. They only become defeated. So if they do uh, run out of life points, they will simply um, maintain their their position. They won't actually respawn. So you can lure them into one area um, and uh, every time they do sort of respawn per se, they'll respawn exactly where you killed them. So um, that makes it so you can lure these elves into an area um, so you can have multiple on you at a time. Now you will need to use aggression potions for this method and I, I highly recommend overload since they do hit extremely hard if you have a lot of them on you. Um, in terms of the drops, they basically are a lot of coin drops, a lot of, a lot of noted drops, and you will get some rune salvage as well. So if you have that spring cleaner, that will be really helpful. The main thing to watch out for while doing this method is your life points. You want to make sure that they don't get too low, especially if you have a lot of them on you. So that is the only thing to be cautious with. And make sure you don't get too many elves on you, especially depending on your combat level. Um, you don't want to get too many on you because they could easily kill you. Now, moving on to our next money make method. It is one that I have done before, but it is even better right now. Um, and that is killing the smoke nigh hills and then going ahead and making the nigh hill pouches. So the requirements are 87 summoning. That is to make the nigh hill pouches. So that is definitely a requirement that you will need. 76 layer just to kill the nigh hills and then fate of the gods, of course, so you can access them. Recommended is 81 Divination. This will allow you to transmute the uh, Avianti Talons, for example, into the other three ingredients to make the other uh, Nigh Hill pouches as well. Sometimes they are a bit more profitable, so having 81 Divination would be really helpful for this. Um, also recommended is 80 Ranged. I recommend using Ranged against the uh, Nigh Hills. That is for a few reasons. Um, first of all, they are uh, weak to ranged, and then also um, it does give you that distance. You don't need to be right on top of them to kill them. Um, and also Corruption Shot. It is a really great ability to use here. It'll allow you to damage the other Nine Hills without making it so they are aggressive to you. Um, so that is another great uh, thing to use here, um, just so you can weaken, weaken the other Nine Hills and you can kill them pretty fast if they are low on health before they get their special out. So Nihils are located in the pit um, going to the world gate. So um, as I mentioned you will want to primarily be fighting the smoke Nihils. So each of these four Nihils they do have their own special attack or mechanic to them. Um, the smoke Nihils basically is uh, a mechanic where it will decrease your stats. Now, if you are using overloads, you will bypass this mechanic completely. That is because overloads make it so your stats have a static boost, meaning they cannot decrease. So if you do have any type of overload, you will be completely safe from the smoke nihil mechanic. Um, and I would primarily focus on the smoke nihils. 
Now, as I mentioned, Corruption Shot, it is a great ability to use here because it will hit some of the other Nihils. Um, and it will actually lower their health enough so you can kill them before they use their mechanic. Um, so if you do see some other Nihils that are quite low on health, definitely go ahead and kill them. Hopefully you do get um, their special drop so you can make the Nihil pouch for them as well. Now, since you are primarily going to be killing the Smoke Nihils, you're going to want to pick up all of the Avianchi Talons. That is going to be the most profitable drop. Um, you're actually going to be making right around 200k every time you get one of these drops, and they're only uncommon. So you are going to be getting a lot of them. That is why this method can easily make you 8 mil per hour. All of the Nihil pouches, they're selling for over 200k right now. Um, so it is a really profitable method. Now, once you are done killing the Nihils, it will be time to figure out which Nihil pouch is the most profitable. Um, and you can use Elder Energy to actually transmute the uh, ingredients into um, the uh, various other Nihils. So, for example, the Ice Nihil pouch was the most profitable at this time. So, I transmuted my Avianti Talons into the Icy and Feathers, so then I can go ahead and make the Ice Nihil pouches instead for more profit. Moving on to our next money making method, we have hunting Grenwalls for about 8 mil per hour. Requirement is 77 Hunter. Also recommended is 71 Summoning. That's for the Arctic Bear pouch. It will basically just allow you to uh, catch a little bit more Grenwalls per hour. The medium Tyron tasks are actually highly recommended. There's something I don't even have done, um, but uh, they will make this method incredible. If not, you will have to use bait on your box traps. Um, so if you have the medium Tyron tasks completed, you won't need bait at all. It'll make this method a lot easier and much more profitable. Now, for this method, you will want to be hunting the Grenwalls and Anachronia. As you can see on the map here, they're located um, on the uh, dots there. There's five of them. Um, so you can head up there through the agility course and then start hunting them. Now, for this method, I would recommend you guys bring some scentless flasks. This will allow you um, to catch some Grenwalls a little bit more effectively. As I mentioned, you don't need Paya meat if you do have those medium tier on tasks. Otherwise, you will have to bait each individual trap. And it is just a lot more time consuming. And also, you will need to go bank and get more to bring back. So this method isn't really recommended with the Paya meat. Um, and you will really want to try and have those tasks completed. Um, but uh, otherwise, this method is a pretty good method. You are going to be getting the Grenwall spikes from the Grenwalls. And these Grenwall spikes, they cost right around 1,300 coins each. But you're going to be getting um, sort of like uh, 15 to 25 per capture. So you're going to be getting a lot of these Grenwall spikes. I would estimate around you know 6k per hour or 5.5k per hour. So you are expecting to make, you know, 7 to 8 mil per hour doing this. And these Grenwall spikes, they're in high demand. They're used for the super ranging potions in order to make them to uh, extreme uh, ranging potions. So they're highly needed for overloads, basically. So they're always in demand. Um, and uh, yeah, that is basically it for this method. You're just going to want to be hunting the Grenwalls. You'll get around 200,000 Hunter XP as well. So it's not bad for training Hunter. Um, but it is also an excellent money-making method. And so this next money-making method is shifting tombs. Um, the only requirements are level 50 in all of the skills listed. So it isn't a major requirement. You'll only need about 100,000 XP in each of these skills. Um, so it is sort of a mid-level money-maker. You can make around 5 mil per hour doing this and... Basically, you're just going to be going through uh, shifting tomes um, at Menifos. Um, you will want to be looting as many chests as possible. That's going to be the main objective. Um, you'll basically want to bypass most of everything else and just loot those chests. Um, and as you guys can see, the loot from the chests include the Feather of Mott. You'll be getting these every time, 5 to 25 of them. So it's going to be 9k to 45k profit every time. 
But as you guys can see, the real moneymaker uh, here is getting that offhand Kopesh. It's worth right around 97 mil right now, and you have a 1 in 800 chance at getting it when looting these chests. You should be able to loot around, let's say, 60 to 100 of these chests per hour pretty easily, depending on how good you are at it and how much you're actually focusing on the method. Um, so you can make well over 5 mil per hour, just depending on how fast you are at doing so. So to start this method, you will want to go to the Shifting Tombs. You can use one of the Menaphos, um Shifting Tombs uh, teleport tabs. Um, to go here, you're going to want to go in solo. Now, if you haven't done Shifting Tombs before, um, it's basically sort of like a dungeon crawler type thing where you're going to be looting chests and you can also smash vases for corruption. Your primary objective is going to be looting these chests, so you will have that chance at that Kopesh. You can also smash these vases as you're going through the tomb. Um, basically, it will give you some crafting XP as you're going through it, um, so I would recommend you guys do that. Now, as you can see in this tomb, there is only one chest, so you can either teleport out once you get that one chest, or you can head to an exit if you do see one just to save a teleport tablet, um, and then you will want to go back in um, and just focus on getting these chests. Now you can have some tombs that have zero chests for those, just teleport out and retry it. Um, but then you can also have some that have up to four chests. So you'll want to make sure that you get each and every chest in the tomb before leaving. Um, and that way you will be able to maximize the amount of chests that you are getting per hour. Um, and uh, yeah, basically that is it for this method. You're just going to want to be rushing through these tombs, getting as many chests as possible. Of course, um, abilities like Surge and uh, Bladed Dive, they're highly recommended for this just to make it so you can go through the tomb a bit faster. If you do also have the mobile perk, that would be helpful as well. Um, and uh, also the Endurance Relic, that might be something that you could use. It'll make it so you have basically unlimited run energy but personally I didn't find a problem with the run energy when going through these dungeons and so next we have killing corrupted scorpions you can make up to six mil per hour doing this even more if you are on task and you can be afk for around two to three minutes at a time the requirements for this method are 88 slayer and Ichthrin's little helper and you will also require some feathers of Ma'at as well um, recommended is 80 plus melee or mage. You can use either, either of these two combat styles. Um, preferably use one or the other and not range just because they are better with AoE damage. Um, also 95 prayer for curses, especially soul split will be really helpful. And 96 herb lore for the overloads. I also provided a recommended setup for this as well. So you can see that I am using Masterwork with the Cinderbane Gauntlets. And then I also am using my Noxious Scythe. You will want to use a two-handed weapon just so you do get to use most of those AoE abilities. And also having a Halberd type weapon with that kind of range will help as well. Um, as for my inventory, you can see that I do have some holy overloads. Um, you will want to bring aggression potions for this method, and then just bring um, some super restores. Of course, the Feather of Mots. I have a Softenum Slayer Dungeon Teleport to get there pretty fast. And then some food and my Enhanced Excalibur. So the Corrupted Scorpions are located in the first room of the Softenum Slayer Dungeon. Um, you might have to hop a few worlds just to get an open one, um, but once you do find one, you can start killing the Corrupted Scorpions by using an Aggression Potion. Also, if you do have your Vampirism Aura all recharged, you can use that as well. It is also a substitute for Soul Split, so if you don't have Soul Split, you can use this instead. Um, if you don't use Soul Split, however, I would recommend using Protect from Melee, um, and that will work just as well as Soul Split. Um, especially if you do have the vampirism aura now another thing to note for this method is you're going to want to make sure that you do have your aoe abilities on your action bar and having revolution plus active this makes this method extra afk for you so if you guys can see on my action bar i have meteor strike hurricane quake and cleave those are all four of those are aoe abilities so having those at the front of my action bar 
I'll get to use them more often, and I'll be able to kill more Corrupted Scorpions. You will be making most of your money off of the Keys to the Crossing. They are a 1 in 400 drop chance if you are off task. However, if you are on task, they're a 1 in 75, so your GP per hour will increase significantly if you do have a Corrupted Creature task. And moving on to our next method, we have Killing Must Buzz. The only requirement for this is Fate of the Gods. However, Ancient Magics are highly recommended. 80 plus magic is also recommended along with curses, especially soul split. You'll make around 4 mil per hour doing this method and you're AFK for about a minute or two at a time. Um, as for the recommended setup, I'm using subjugation with my noxious staff. Um, you can use this setup here, it is pretty good. The vampirism aura also does work. Uh, you're going to want to make sure to bring the spring cleaner and use ancient magics. Since you do have your ancient magic spellbook, you're going to want to bring some magic note paper just for those drag and drops. Also, while you are doing this method, make sure that you are picking up all of the Elder Charms. These are really helpful later on when you're making um, the Nihil pouches. You will need these, so make sure you are keeping them. Um, you can also make Muspa pouches as if, you, if you do keep the Muspa spines as well. So uh, they are really useful to have. So Muspas are located within the World Gate, that is why you need to complete the Fate of the Gods quest. Um, you'll want to go to the Cradle, and that's where the three Muspas will spawn. They will be aggressive if you aren't wearing the Shard of Zero, so that's why you're not going to want to use it. You want them to be aggressive, it really does save you from having to use uh, an Overload. And when you are using Ancient Magics, you are dealing 50% more damage, so you're going to be killing them pretty effectively. Um, if you have Soul Split, you will have no problem at all. Vampirism Aura is an alternative to Soul Split, um, but it really does make this method extremely AFK. You'll just need to check it um, to make sure that your prayer is still active and to pick up the drops. Now, as I mentioned, you're going to be making money off of the Alkables, so your Spring Cleaner is going to be making a lot of the money for you. However, Maspas also do drop a bunch of coin drops. They drop some dragon items like the dragon mace and offhand dragon mace. So there are going to be some items that you'll need to pick up and use the magic note paper on. Um, and they also do drop the Maspa spines. So these can't be noted um, with magic note paper. You'll need to either send them to the bank with a pack yak or you can just uh, not pick them up. Um, personally, I don't usually pick them up just because it does um, take a little bit more effort, but uh, it will boost your profit a little bit if you do want a little bit of extra GP per hour. And moving on to our next method, we have killing Rorari, which is one of the Ascension creatures. Only requirement is level 81 Slayer, however, you will really want to make sure that you are using ranged against them. So 80 plus range is highly recommended for this method. Also, Curses and Corruption Shot are really helpful um, for this method as well. Corruption Shot is mainly used um, just so you can kill them pretty AFK. Um, it is really helpful because it's sort of an AoE ability where it will hit all of them at once. Now, you can make around 4 mil per hour from this, and you'll be AFK for a minute or two at a time. So, the Ascension Creatures, they are located in the Ascension Dungeon, which is basically just north of the Uglog. Uh, lodestone. You can go into the monastery uh, entrance. Now here they are in the first room. You're going to want to make sure that you are using the aggression potions. Now in order to make this method fairly AFK, you're going to want to make sure that a lot of your AoE abilities are at the front of your action bar, like corruption shot and then also ricochet. These are your main two abilities. You'll also want to have death swiftness up there as well. Um, just so you will use that as an ultimate ability. So these abilities are going to help a lot. Um, if you do have Bombardment, you're going to want to use that uh, periodically as well, since it will hit uh, the Rorari if they are uh, in clusters. Now, most of the money you're going to be making from this creature are from the Ascension Keys. They're actually worth a lot right now. Uh, they range from about 200k up to 800k, so you're going to be making a lot of money off of those. The drop rate for these Ascension Keystones aren't even that bad. They have a drop rate of 1 in 384, but there are 6 of them. So basically that is a 1 in 64 chance. Um, and they are worth quite a bit of money. 
So you're going to be making a decent amount of money off of this. And as you can see, it is a bit AFK. Um, not as AFK as some other combat related methods, um, but it doesn't have too high requirements either. As for the requirements for this method, you will need 99 Slayer to have access to the player on Slayer Dungeon. And of course, you'll need to have a Slayer Dungeon with the Capsarius in them. You can also join a friend Slayer Dungeon as well if they happen to have a dungeon occupied by Capsarius. And a decent range level is recommended, so anything above level 70 would be fine, but I'm sure you probably have that if you have 99 Slayer. So aside from that, there aren't really any other requirements. I do recommend using a setup similar to mine. As you can see, I am actually wearing masterwork legs, which is quite odd. Of course, armadillo legs or some other type of ranged legs would be much better. But the key takeaway to this and the reason why I am using masterwork legs is because it does have scavenging four on them. And scavenging is an exceptional perk to have when doing this method. You will be able to kill up to 1,000 of these creatures per hour, meaning you will get quite a few procs. And this will essentially just allow you to save money when you are making better invention perks. Now aside from this, you will want to wear some averaged ranged gear. And you could use the Vampirism Aura to heal yourself throughout this method as well. You can also bring a spring cleaner as well, since this will be able to disassemble and alk some of the lower tier salvage for some extra profit. Now, for your inventory, you will want to bring aggression potions and an enhanced Excalibur and Elven Ritual Shard. Those are also helpful. You'll want to bring magic notepaper to note the ascension keys and then I do have some super restores as well as basically one of every noted item uh, just to make the inventory more organized. So now that you know everything you can start the method, you will want the Capsarius in your small Slayer dungeon. And once you do this, you'll want to turn on Legacy and go to the middle of the room and use an aggression potion. Now, the reason you do want to do this method on legacy mode is because your auto attacks will hit much higher and you'll basically be able to one or two hit every cap serious with an auto attack. So this method is fully AFK. You'll just need to make sure that your aggression potion is always active and to pick up the ascension keys before they despawn. Now, on average, you should get one ascension keystone every 64 kills. So you will be able to make around 8 mil per hour depending on the amount of kills you're able to get. But you should be able to get close to the 1000 kills per hour if you're using a setup similar to mine. While testing this method myself, I spent around 3 or 3.5 three hours at Capsarius and got around 3000 kills as well as about 33 mil in loot from the keystones, plus a few extra million from the Alp salvage and coin drops. So for the requirements, you will need 85 Dungeoneering just to enter the Frost Dragon's Lair. 85 Herblore is recommended so that you can make and use the Super Anti-Fire Potions, and you will want to have decent combat as well, recommended at about uh, level 110 or higher. Highly recommended is the upgraded Bone Crusher, and it actually takes two steps to obtain this item. First, you must purchase the Bone Crusher for 34,000 Dungeoneering tokens. Then, the second step is that you can upgrade it for 25,000 chimes, and then also 25 of the currency Teatu. Now, this will make it so the Bone Crusher can automatically pick up bones for you, which will basically double the amount of bones you can collect per hour. Now, unfortunately, I don't have the upgraded Bone Crusher, so I can't show you how fast you can do this, but I will demonstrate the method as best I can. Now, another recommended item is the Death Note Relic, which you can obtain with 108 Archaeology. And this will allow you to note all of the bones that are dropped. Using these two together, you will automatically be able to collect noted frost dragon bones after each kill. This will allow you to collect well over 500 frost dragon bones per hour, making you well over 12 million coins per hour. Frost dragons are located in the Asgardian Ice Resource Dungeon. You can get here by teleporting to Port Serum. 
then going south to the dungeon, then to the resource dungeon area. You can also teleport here using the Dungeoneering Cape if you do have 99 Dungeoneering. Now in terms of gear for this method, you will want to use ranged or magic. The Frost Dragons, they aren't too strong and they will only have 8,500 life points, so you should be able to kill them quite fast, even with average gear. Unfortunately, I don't have the upgraded Bone Crusher, so I wasn't able to test just how many Frost Dragon Bones you can possibly get in an hour. But with the method that I was using, so I had to go pick up the bones, I was able to collect right around 300 per hour, meaning with the Bone Crusher, I could imagine you would, could double this number. So anywhere from 500 to 600 Frost Dragon Bones per hour would be feasible. And so next we have Jad Farming, which is essentially farming wave 16 of the Zuck fight. I highly recommend using either ranged or magic. As you can see on screen, this is my range setup. There can be a few extra upgrades that you can add to this setup if you do have them, um, but I highly recommend having at least an AoE weapon, which would be the mechanized chinchampas. For the magic setup, uh, it is fairly similar. Um, there are a lot of AoE abilities that you can use with magic, so it is a really good setup to use in order to reach wave 17. I do prefer ranged when you are at wave 17 and you're starting to actually fight the three jets. Now uh, to start this method you will first need to make it to wave 17. I will be linking my full guide on how to reach 17 for the jad farming so uh, that will be in the description if you guys would like to check that out. Now in terms of farming the triple jad wave I recommend you guys use ranged. As you can see when I am farming this wave, um, you will want to make sure to stand in this location right here. That way only one of the Jads will hit you at a time. If you do have the uh, Saren God Bow, the special attack is extremely effective against Jads, so that is something that is extremely helpful. Um, but as you can see, you will want to just target one Jad at a time. Um, once you kill the second Jad, you will want to teleport out. That way you can go back to this wave when you come back in. You will also get some marks of war while you are killing these Jads, which is a pretty nice bonus. And the loot from these Jads is pretty great as well. So a Jad actually has two different drop tables. It has the common drop table, which is the table on the left. As you can see, the drops are much worse than the drop table on the right. So Jad has a higher chance of dropping items from the Elite table, which is the table on the right with the uncut onyx. As you can see, you are going to be making most of the money from the large blunt or calcum salvage. Um, you will be making around 400 to 600k um, if you do happen to get this drop. Also, the Onyx Bolt Tips, the Hydric Bolt Tips, these are both really great drops as well. The Onyx Dust is a pretty good drop since it does drop a lot of Onyx Dust. Um, so most of these drops you are going to be making quite a bit of money off of. And based on my calculations, I was able to kill right around 82 Jads in one hour. Um, so I did happen to make quite a bit of money in that hour. So looking at my loot from one hour of killing Jads, I was able to make right around 14 mil in that one hour. And I did kill 82 Jads in that hour. As you can see, most of the money came from the large blunted or calcum salvage, um, six mil just from that. I also got one onyx drop, which is just about 1.1 mil. And all of the other drops just also added up. I got some Hydric Bolt Tips, I got some Onyx Bolt Tips, um, and honestly, I don't think this chest was extremely lucky, so you should be able to expect um, making right around 14 mil per hour. Now, the next method we have is Big Game Hunter. Now, you can do the low tier Big Game Hunter and mid tier. I'm recommending doing the mid tier because it is the best gp per hour and it is quite consistent especially when you are doing the corbicular rex so uh, the requirements for the corbicular rex is 90 hunter and 70 slayer 
Also recommended for big game hunter in general is the mobile perk along with double surge and bladed dive to help with your mobility. And also the quick traps unlock which does cost 50 hunter marks is extremely helpful. If you do have a dwarven chainsaw in your bank you can use that as well. It will allow you to collect two of the logs um, every time it allow you to gather double resources so this too is quite helpful and you can make around 12 mil per hour doing this method now as i said we're going to be focusing on the mid-tier uh, dinosaurs that we will be doing big game hunter for so uh, specifically these three and as you can see i did uh, put the location to each three of these dinosaurs on screen as well now the best one to do for sure is the Corbicula Rex. This one drops the uh, Corbicula Rex meat, which is worth about 290k each right now. Um, it will always drop about one or two of them. So obviously you're making 290k to 580k every uh, time you get one of these captures. Um, now another really rare drop that you can get from the Big Game Hunter is the Dragomatic. It's worth around 19 mil right now although the drop rate is 1 in 101 so that will obviously help out the GP per hour as well if you get one of those um, but uh, if you are doing these mid tier uh, big game hunter creatures the money is pretty consistent since they drop their uh, meat every time and it is worth quite a bit now moving on to the actual big game hunter encounter you're gonna need the bait to start this encounter you can actually store the bait in the bait box, which is super helpful. That way you won't need to bring all of the bait in your inventory and it will give you some inventory space because later on in this encounter, you will be gathering some materials to actually do the encounter. So to start the encounter, just go to the bait box. Um, you can start it if you have the bait in your inventory. Now, when you start these encounters, um, you will have uh, roughly 20 minutes to uh capture as many of these dinosaurs as possible um, also when you first start you're gonna want to start by gathering the resources so you can see that I'm gonna be cutting this tree for a while um, I like filling out my full inventory with logs and then fletching approximately 9 to 12 of the spears um, that way you won't need to go chop down more logs later on in the encounter I do find it just saves some time and it's the most efficient way of doing it You'll definitely want to cut more logs than the vines, but you also do need the vines to build the scorpions. So start off the encounter by getting a bunch of the spears as well as keeping some logs in your inventory. I like keeping uh, seven or eight of them. Then you want to chop down at least three vines and then you can go ahead and start building the scorpions and the pressure plate. Now the scorpions, they cost one log and one vine to build and then the pressure plate just costs one log. Once the scorpions are built, you can arm them with spears. However, you will need to tip them with poison. So that is what these frogs are here for. You can see that there's three different colors of frogs, the yellow, red, and blue frogs. For your first encounter, you're going to want to determine which type of poison is most effective against the dinosaur. Um, so as you can see, I am testing out the yellow poison. Um, so what you're going to want to do is get two yellow poison and one red. Then when you go ahead and bait the pressure plate, you'll be able to figure out which of these poisons is most effective. So you'll be able to figure out which poison to use by looking at the chat box after you uh, first arm the scorpions and bait the pressure plate. You can see that the golden poison damage did 30,000, so we obviously know that golden is the best because 30,000 is the max hit. Now if you don't get 30,000 on either of the two poisons, you'll know that it is the third one, the one you didn't try. Um, but for this encounter, it is going to be the yellow poison. So since the dinosaur only has 15,000 health, we can only arm one scorpion and bait the pressure plate again and we'll get the kill. Now, this is where it becomes really fast. Um, since you already know the poison, the next encounter is really efficient. You'll just need to arm all of the scorpions with the golden poison or the most effective poison and you'll be able to kill the big game hunter dinosaur in one shot. If you are pretty efficient with big game hunter you should be able to complete three full dinosaur encounters in an hour so um, basically once, once you uh, kill enough of the corbicular rex it will go into hiding then you'll need to go ahead and move on to another mid-tier dinosaur. Um, so it does work that way. Um, you can't 
consistently just camp the corbicular rex you will need to move on to one of the other two that i did show you um, but uh, you can do this for a full hour and you should make right around 12 mil per hour just off of all of these drops now moving on to the next method we have lava strike worms and this is one of my favorite money making methods in the game and i have mentioned it before but i am mentioning it in this video because it is even better right now and that is because the searing ashes have gone through the roof right now they're worth over 110k each so you can easily make 12 mil per hour at lava strike worms just by killing about 80 of them per hour Lava Strike Worms also drop another item along with the Searing Ashes, which also are priced quite high. But anyway, looking at the method, there is only one main requirement, which is 94 Slayer, so not a super high requirement, but it is fairly high at least. Um, recommended, however, is the Elite Wilderness Tasks. This is highly recommended. It will make it so the Searing Ashes are noted, and this is really helpful since you are going to be in the wilderness. It's going to save you the inventory space, and it is also just a really nice quality of life thing. Um, also recommended is at least 90 plus combat. However, if you have 94 Slayer, I'm pretty sure you have a pretty good combat level. Also recommended is an Amulet of Glory or even a Wilderness Sword. This will allow you to teleport out of the wilderness if you're uh, below thir level 30 wilderness. So this is really helpful because the Lava Strike Worms are right around level 35 wilderness. So you will have to walk a little bit south before you can teleport. As you can see, with my gear setup, I'm using really basic and cheap armor. I'm using Royal Dragonhide armor, but I am also bringing my Noxious Longbow. So this is a really expensive weapon, but you do always get to keep at least one weapon in the wilderness if you do have your item protection on. Um, I also like to bring a Fury Shark in case of emergencies. This will allow you to keep one extra item for one minute after eating it if you do happen to die. Um, so it will basically make it so I will always keep one item at least. So in order to get to the Lava Strike Worms, I like using the Wilderness Sword. You can teleport to the Herb Patch in the Wilderness and then you can run west um, until you reach the Lava Strike Worms. Now, as I mentioned, it is in the Wilderness. It's deep in the Wilderness as well, so you do need to keep your eye out for players. There are sometimes PKers roaming around the Lava Strike Worms since... It is a really good money maker, so they're looking to kill players who are trying to take advantage of it. That being said, from my personal experience, and I do have over 2,000 kills at these creatures, I haven't found too many PKers. You might find one every 100 kills or so, um, but it isn't a super popular area at least. So as you can see with killing the Lava Strike Worms, they are pretty simple. However, they do have this one mechanic where they, where they will go underground and they'll sort of drag you in. So this is their only mechanic. All you need to do is step out of the way. Um, otherwise, you'll take about a 4k to the face. But aside from that, the Lava Strike Worms, they are pretty easy. Um, the main thing that you should watch out for with this method is just watching for PKers, other players in the wilderness that are looking to kill you. Um, so just keep your eyes out and always look around you, you and be aware of your surroundings. If someone does start running towards you, you'll want to run away as fast as possible and try and teleport out um, if they don't teleblock you. Um, if they do teleblock you, it will be a really rough, uh, slow walk to the wilderness border. Um, but even if you do die, you should be able to keep um, your valuable items. If you don't attack them and you're not sculled, you'll keep at least three items. With your item protection, you'll keep another. Um, and as you guys can see, I'm using some really basic gear, so they won't be making much money off of me. Um, basically, they'll just get um, my food and my uh, ashes that I already got from the fight. So you won't be losing too much, um, but it will be a bit frustrating. Um, but my, as I said, in my experience, there aren't too many PKers out here. The next method is Water Fiend Binding Contracts. And this is actually a really easy method. There aren't too many requirements. The only requirement is 68 Archaeology along with the Dagon by Mystery. And that might be some of the more difficult requirements. And then the third requirement is 50 Summoning in order to make the Binding Contracts. Recommended is 90 plus ranged. You could do this method with as low as 70 ranged, but it would be a bit slower. 
Water fiends is also one of the best range training methods as well. You should be able to get anywhere from around 500k XP per hour or higher. So it is awesome to train your range here as well. And you can also make some pretty good GP per hour on the side. You can make around 15 mil per hour doing this method. However, there are a few steps to it. So we're gonna jump into the first step, which is actually making the binding contracts. Now each binding contract, as you guys can see, is made by using two Blood of Orcus and two Hellfire Metal. So you will want to create some presets um, so that you can make these binding contracts. You'll want the blue charms, um, pouches, and uh, spirit shards with you so you can make the binding contracts. Um, they cost right around 29k to make for each of these contracts. Um, but then when you go ahead and turn them into the water fiend contracts, they cost right around 57k right now. So you're going to be making about 27k profit per water fiend that you do kill and you can kill a lot of them per hour so you are going to be able to make quite a bit of GP per hour um, doing that. Uh, the only downside about it is that it does cost blue charms to make these binding contracts and blue charms they can be difficult to obtain um, so that is probably the one thing that is quite costly with this method. So the next part of this method is just going to be going to the Ancient Caverns to kill the Water Fiends. They are a pretty easy creature to kill, especially if you are using ranged. Um, and as I mentioned, you are going to be making about 25 to 27k profit for each of these kills. Um, I recommend bringing some magic notepaper just so you can note the uh, binded contracts once they are made. Um, that way you can just stay here for a long period of time. Um, now, another thing about this method is that um, you can kill right around 600, maybe even 700 of these per hour. Uh, so you will want to have a lot of binding contracts made before you go here, uh, basically just depending on how long you're planning on staying. Another great thing about this method is that you also do get a lot of XP per hour. Water Fiends is actually one of the better places to train ranged, and you should be able to get around 700k ranged XP per hour doing this method as well. So if you guys aren't already 99 ranged, this might be a great money-making method to help you guys get there. Now moving on to our last method, we have killing Salawa Axe. Now this is also an AFK money-making method, and you will be able to make 5 mil per hour quite easily and this is off task if you are on task the gp per hour is much higher and it would be close to 10 mil per hour as for the requirements you will require 105 slayer to kill the selawa ox as well as the jack of the spades quest and the ikthren's little helper quest recommended is the vital spark drop enhancers you can purchase these from the dungeoneering shop for 1000 dungeoneering tokens they're highly recommended because they will double the vital sparks that you will be getting from the drops. And right now, vital sparks are worth right around 300k each. So basically, you're spending 1,000 dungeoneering tokens for 300k. Also recommended is the Noxious Scythe or a Dragon Rider Lance. Uh, you'll just need a pretty solid two-hand weapon so you can use the AoE abilities with melee. And you'll also want overloads and curses. As you can see with my gear setup, I am using Masterwork with the Noxious Scythe along with Cinderbanes. And for the inventory, I have uh, basically some overloads, I have super restores, some aggression potions, and then also you will need the Feather of Mats in order to kill these creatures. Uh, you can see I do have the Vital Spark Drop Enhancers as well as some Weapon Poison and a bunch of Emergency Food. Salawa Axe are located in the Sophonim Slayer Dungeon, which means all the loot you will be obtaining from these creatures can go straight to the chest, making it so you don't have to pick up any drops. This makes the method quite AFK, and the only thing you'll really need to focus on is staying alive and making sure your health doesn't go too low. You can set up a revolution action bar similar to mine. You'll want your AoE abilities at the front. I also do recommend using the deflect from melee or protect from melee. Um, it is much better than soul split since these creatures do hit quite hard. 
And since you are using this, I do recommend having devotion in your action bar as well. So you can use that every once in a while just to recover some health. You can see that I am using the Vampirism Aura. I do highly recommend this as well. Um, you will need to be restoring some health for this method, so you can use the Vampirism Aura. Alternatively, you could also use a Vampirism Scrimshaw. However, this will cut into the profits a little bit. Now, if you decide to use the Vampirism Scrimshaw, it will make the method much more AFK. Um, and you won't really have to worry about your health dropping. But aside from that, you'll just want to make sure that your aggression potion is always active and you're continuously killing the Salawa Axe. When you are ready to collect the loot, just head to the chest and most of the money will be coming from those vital sparks. And as I mentioned, you will be able to make right around 5 mil per hour doing this method. So, when crafting water runes, there is only one real requirement being 5 rune crafting. However, there are also a ton of recommendations. So first off, the small through massive rune crafting pouches are quite important for this method if you're looking to maximize on the GP per hour. Also, 95 rune crafting is especially helpful. As with 95 rune crafting, you will be able to craft 6 times the water runes. 93 summoning is also extremely helpful for the Abyssal Titan familiar. The Nexus mod relic is extremely helpful as well. This is a relic that you can obtain through archaeology. And it will allow you to teleport to the middle of the Abyss when you are doing that through the Zamorak Mage. So extremely helpful and it will cut down on the run times. The pouch pr protector relic is also extremely helpful. Um, you will be degrading these pouches as you use them. But if you have this pouch protector relic active, then you will not be degrading your pouches. So this does save you a ton of time since you won't have to be uh, repairing your pouches in between runs. Also, just some recommended items. They aren't as important, but they still do help quite a bit. 99 farming is quite helpful, especially if you do have the Arcane Apoterosaur. This will allow you to increase the base water runes you are crafting by 2 if you have the Tier 2 perk active on the Arcane Apoterosaur. A Tier 1 perk would also boost it by plus 1, so either one will be helpful if you can do that. Double Surge as well as the Mobile perk is also quite helpful. It will help with the mobility and you will be able to complete runs a bit faster. Same with Bladed Dive. The Wilderness Sword is also quite helpful since you will be able to teleport back to Edgeville just by a click of a button. Also, as you can see, I did list an example of uh, a gear setup that you will want to use. You can see that the Infinity Ethereal outfit is equipped so if you do have this you will really want to wear it um, it will give you an extra 12 slots of pure essence that you will be able to carry in the body so you will want to put that on your action bar as well and you can also see that i am using the exploring 4 which you can obtain by completing all of the lumbridge achievements the Explorer Ring 4 will give you a 10% chance to craft an additional rune per essence. And also, I didn't put this on the list because there wasn't really much room, but the Hero's Welcome Quest is also quite helpful because it will give you a plus 5% boost when uh, crafting runes. Another thing that I would like to show you guys is the rune crafting multiplier table. So as you can see with the water runes, you will be able to craft 6 times runes at 95 rune crafting. But you can actually craft 7 times runes if your level is boosted to 114. So the extreme rune crafting potion can be made at level 91 herb lore if you would like to boost your level. If your rune crafting level is above level 82, it will boost your rune crafting level by 17. Meaning that in order to hit the 114, you will need to have 97 rune crafting. So you can do this if you want to make some extra profit. It will increase that multiplier to times 7 if you do boost it to 114 or higher. Okay, so to start this method, you will want to start in the bank. Um, so you will want to create a preset much like mine. I do have my massive, giant, large medium and small pouches 
And then I also do have the rest of the inventory with pure essence as well as one power burst of sorcery, which is what you will want to be using uh, every time you go to runecraft the runes. Typically, you might only be able to use this once every two or three runs if you are doing it quite fast. So you might want to make a second preset without the power burst of sorcery just to get that one uh, extra pure essence that you can runecraft. So along with this preset, I do also have uh, my Abyssal Titan. It is full of pure essence as well. So again, to start the method, go in to the bank uh, interface. You're going to want to start by filling the massive pouch. So just right click it, then fill. Then you will want to load your preset. Now, once you load the preset, you will want to fill the giant and large pouch. Now I do have it on my keybind, so I can use these keybinds to fill them. After that, you will want to then take from your familiar. So again, I do have that key binded. After that, you can fill the medium pouch and fill the small pouch. If you do have the full infinity ethereal body or the infinity ethereal set, you can fill that. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have the full set yet, so I cannot fill that. Um, but uh, once you do that, you'll want to go back into the bank load the preset and then you are set to go start runecrafting. So from here you will start in Edgeville because that's where you will be teleporting after each run. So you will want to go up to the wilderness wall, try surging when possible. Uh, double surge is also useful if you do have bladed dive, um, that's helpful as well. And you're going to want to go to the Mage of Zamrock. If it is your first time, you can actually configure it so you can uh, teleport to the Abyss just by clicking on them or left clicking on them, which is quite helpful. Um, if you do have that Nexus mod relic active, you will teleport straight to the middle. Um, so this is quite helpful. Um, as you can see, the water rift is right here. So there you'll want to exit through the water rift. And then you're at the water altar. Now, if you can use the power burst of sorcery, you will want to use it now. Um, that way you will get double the runes. So I'll do that. And there you go, crafted 1,080 water runes in one run, which is about 218K. And again, that is without uh, the Infinity Ethereal Body. I am also missing a few other boosts in uh, my setup just because I don't have them, like the Explorer's Ring 4. This will give you a 10% chance to craft an additional rune per essence used. Also, the Arcane Apoterosaur perk, um, you can get plus two uh, rune multiplier if you do have that perk in the uh, Ranch Out of Time farm. And also the Hero's Welcome Quest. If you do have that completed, it does offer a 5% boost as well. And I also didn't use the Extreme Runecrafting Potion to boost my runecrafting level to above 114, which means I only had the time 6 multiplier active where I could potentially get the time 7. So if I did have all of the boosts active, you will be able to craft 1,339 water runes per run, which right now is about 270k. Uh, now you will have a chance at the magical threads as well, and that's where you will be getting some additional profit, and it definitely will add up if you are doing this for a full hour. And so anyway, once you are finished um, crafting your water runes, again, just teleport back to Edgeville using your wilderness sword. Um, and then you'll just want to go to the bank and repeat the process. So it is quite tedious, quite click intensive, um, but uh, it definitely is a pretty profitable method if you are uh, open to you know spending the time doing this. You do also get a decent amount of runecrafting XP as well, which is pretty nice. I estimated that you would get anywhere from 150 to 170,000 runecrafting XP per hour, depending on how fast you are doing the method. Now, in my personal experience, when I was testing out this method, it did take me right around 50 seconds to a minute to complete. I probably could have done it a bit faster. There were a few moments where I did 
miss out on a bit of time and I was a bit slow on things. But overall, I would say that you should be able to do anywhere from 70 to 75 runs per hour. Um, and you could probably do more if you did click extremely efficiently, but of course we are all human. So I do think this is a pretty good approximation. Now, if you are able to do 72 of these trips per hour, you will be getting 27 mil GP per hour, and that is at the current prices of water runes at 202 coins each. If you are able to do 80 trips per hour, which is one trip every 45 seconds, which is doable, you will be able to make over 30 mil profit per hour just by crafting water runes. And with that, that is all I have for you in this guide. I really hope you did find this guide helpful. I did try to make it in-depth and slow it down for you guys, since there is actually a lot to this method, even though it is only one money-making method. There are a lot of recommendations and that do help the profit per hour when doing this method. And so next, we have Killing Nightmare Creatures. Now there are quite a few requirements for this including the Children of Ma quest. This is a Grandmaster quest so it does have a lot of other prerequisite quests that you will need to have completed. Um, so that is a pretty good requirement there. Um, also 80 Slayer is required to kill Nightmare Creatures as well. Um, and recommended a high magic level, preferably 90 plus. Um, Cannon or the Oldak Coil is also helpful with this method. And then also 95 Prayer and 96 Herblore for the Curses and Overloads. You should be able to make around 8 mil per hour doing this method. Now if you are on task, your GP per hour will be a bit higher, um, right around 9 or 10 mil per hour. Now looking at the gear setup, as you can see you are going to want to use magic. Um, and preferably you will want to use ancient magics as well. Blood Barrage is a really good spell to use here since you will be able to hit multiple targets at once. Also, if you do have the Inquisitor Staff, this will be really useful here. It'll go up to a tier 97 staff, so if you do have that, make sure to bring it. Um, also, if you have Cinder Banes, they're super helpful because Nightmares are not immune to poison, so that'll allow you to deal a little bit extra damage. You can use the Vampirism Aura. Um, it'll basically just make it so you don't need food at all. Um, you are going to want to be praying ranged as well as using torment for curses. Um, but that is basically it for the magic setup. Looking at just your inventory, as you can see, we have the enhanced scalper. If you do have that, that's always helpful. Um, bring an overload, also a bunch of prayer potions. You are going to want to bring some cannonballs and the old act coil. Um, if you don't have the old act coil, you can bring a cannon. Alternatively, that does work as well. Um, then just bring some food and also some magic note paper because they will have a few dragon battle staff drops that they will be dropping. You could use winter stored scrolls instead of the magic note paper as well um, if that's what you want to do. So to get to nightmare creatures you are going to want to go to the world gate. Um, now you will want to redial it to the first option which is Freneske. Um, now you can enter it and just choose the ritual site, which should be the last option. You will unlock this option after the Children of Ma quest. You will be teleported to the ritual site where the nightmare creatures are located. Just walk a little bit to the west and you'll see the nightmare creatures. Now something really important about this method is the placement of your cannon or old act coil. Um, so I'm going to show you the best spot to place it. Um, it is right where these two uh, nightmare creatures up here spawn. Um, so you're going to want to place it right in the middle of them so that you will always have at least one of them aggroed onto you. Now nightmare creatures will attack with melee attacks, but they will also use a range attack which can deal up to 4,000 damage. So that is why you are going to want to be using or praying ranged. Um, it's because after every five auto attacks, they will use that range attack and it will deal a lot of damage as opposed to just blocking the uh, melee attacks. You will also want the Vampirism Aura for this reason since you aren't using Soul Split. Um, that way you will be able to heal a little bit, a bit of health as well instead of just taking a lot of damage. Now also Blood Barrage will heal you a little bit as well which is why you should use that spell. Uh, aside from that, that is basically it for the mechanics to kill the Nightmare Creatures. You should be able to kill around three to 400 per hour um, depending on your gear setups and stuff like that. Um, but also another thing to note with the Nightmare Creatures is their, their drops. So they do drop the Nightmare Gauntlets. Now when you are off task, the 
Uh, chances of getting a Nightmare Gauntlet drop is 1 in 10,000. So you're probably not going to get that. The drop is worth around 46 mil right now. Um, but as I said, the GP per hour is a lot higher while you are on task. So if you are on task, uh, the drop rate for those Nightmare Gauntlets are dropped to 1 in 2,000. So a 1 in 2,000 shot at getting a 46 mil drop will increase your GP per hour by about 1 mil per hour. And it will put it up from about 8 mil up to 9 mil per hour. Now, Nightmare Creatures, they also have a lot of other really great drops, including the uh, Dragon Battle Staff drops. These are uncommon drops, and they sell for about 120k each. So a lot of money off of those. They also have some noted rune salvage, as well as just some random runes and arrowheads and stuff like that, which all do add up. Um, and overall, you can make around 8 mil per hour, killing about 400 of them. Uh, an hour as well so it is a really good money making method for high level players you'll get a decent bit of xp as well um they're about seven to eight hundred k mage xp as well as two hundred and fifty thousand constitution xp per hour starting off with our first money making method we have killing living wyverns so there are a few requirements to this method including 96 slayer and 89 herb lore the 89 herb lore is for the super worm fire potions also recommended is 90 plus melee stats, 95 prayer for curses, and 96 herbler for overloads. Living wyverns are a pretty tough creature to kill, so you'll basically want max stats when you are trying to kill them. They do hit really hard, and there are a few mechanics to them as well, so you do need to pay attention and know what you're doing. Now, as you guys can see, I did include a sample gear setup and inventory setup so i am using masterwork i really highly recommend using dual wield over two-handed weapons that's because you get in melee distance so the living wyverns will only attack with melee rather than using all three combat styles so this makes it a lot easier so i do highly recommend using dual wield weapons also as you can see i have my holy overloads my super restores i also have the worm fire potion and then also bring some anti poisons since you will need these for this fight then also i like bringing the magic note paper just to note the bones and that is basically it leave some inventory spaces because these guys have a lot of different drops um, but of course you will need some food and probably should bring a beast of burden with food as well especially if you're new to this method the Living Wyvern's lair is located in the Asgarnian Ice Dungeon, and once you do reach this dungeon, there are a few mechanics that you do need to worry about, especially a cold feature. So essentially what this is, is when you do enter the dungeon, your player will become cold, and you'll have around 20-25% cold mechanic. And once you do light one of the bonfires, you don't require any logs, you can just light them automatically. Um, when you stand next to them, basically you will... Um, actually lower your cold temperature now this is really important to do whenever you get around 60 or 70 percent coldness that's because the more cold that you are the more damage you will be taking from the wyvern poison so for example when you are at about 25 percent coldness you will be taking about 900 damage every four or five ticks compared to 2500 damage if you do have 90 percent cold so do keep an eye on that meter it should be on your debuff bar and whenever it gets a bit too high just go to one of these bonfires light it and stand next to it you can also kill a living wyvern that's near the bonfire while you're there um, so you don't waste out on any kills per hour now aside from that the other really big thing that you want to pay attention to with the living wyverns is staying within melee distance that's why I want you guys to use the dual wield weapons. So when you are within melee distance, they only use melee. So you can use protect or deflect melee, which makes it a lot easier. Now, another thing you will always want to have your worm fire potion active and then also have the anti poison active as well. Um, you will be constantly taking damage from the um, poison that the worm that the living wyverns do uh, emit. But um, depending on the cold meter, as I mentioned, it will uh, actually lower it if you have a lower coldness. Living Wyverns do attack you pretty hard, and you will actually be taking a lot of damage from them. But don't worry, if you do have your Vampirism Aura and even a Vampirism Scrimshaw active, then you shouldn't have any problem. You might even be able to get away without using the Vampirism Scrimshaw. However, it does make it a little bit easier and just more relaxing if you do have it active. Um, but just... Pay attention to your health bar, make sure you aren't getting too low on life points, eat when you when necessary, 
Um, but overall, you should be fine doing this. Um, they don't have too many life points, so you should be able to kill them pretty quickly, and you shouldn't be able to take too much damage from them. This next high-level money-making method is killing Abyssal Beasts. So Abyssal Beasts do require level 105 Slayer, which is a fairly high requirement. You'll also want to have some pretty high combat skills as well, which you probably do have if you have 105 Slayer. Now recommended is the Mask of the Abyss. This will allow you to get double the drops every 10th kill, basically increasing your GP per hour by 10%. You'll also want the Spring Cleaner, and you'll want to be on a, an Abyssal Demon Slayer task. It does increase the chances at getting the Jaws of the Abyss Helm, so you will want that. You can also use the Death Note Relic as well. Um, that way it will note the Infernal Ashes and increase your GP per hour slightly. So the Abyssal Beasts are located in the Sanisen Asylum. I do recommend using either magic or melee against them. I prefer using magic with the Inquisitor's Staff since it does have its buff here. Um, and basically you will want to be using a lot of AoE abilities like uh, Chain or Greater Chain and Dragon Breath. Now as you can see the Abyssal Beasts are actually aggressive to you when you first enter the Asylum. So after about 5 to 10 minutes, they won't become aggressive anymore, so you will need to use aggression potions at that point. And you can also see that my setup is fairly similar to an Abyssal Demon uh, type setup. Um, you can even use, you know, the Demon Horn Necklace as well as the Attuned Ectoplasmeter. Um, that combination will work here to give you unlimited prayer. But uh, anyway, you will just want to you know stand in the middle of the room here uh, as you can see there's basically three spots you can stand in um, you can see one person in each spot and here you'll just aoe the abyssal beasts now you do have a chance at getting the jaws of the abyss helm which is priced at around 40 mil and because of that right now you can make around 15 mil per hour depending on your kills per hour and so starting off with our first AFK money making method, we have killing the crystal shapeshifters. Now specifically I will be showing you how to do it with the Inquisitor's Staff in legacy mode since this is actually one of the best ways to kill them. Uh, now requirements does include 99 Slayer, you will need the Sunken Pyramid as well which of course requires the Jack of Spades quest. Also, 95 Prayer and Curses, these are basically needed because Crystal Shapeshifters, they do hit quite hard. So, uh, Soul Split and, of course, Torment will be required for this method for it to be effective. The Light Within quest is required in order to fight the Crystal Shapeshifters, so that's another requirement. And recommended is the Inquisitor Staff. Um, the Crystal Shapeshifters, they are weak to the Inquisitor Staff, so you will get, get that damage buff, basically making it a tier 97 staff. Crystal Gear is also really helpful. Um, I recommend bringing 3 to 4 pieces of Crystal Gear if you have it. Also Amulet of Souls. Uh, 92 magic, so you can use Blood Barrage as well as the Ancient Magics. Um, and uh, that would uh, require the Temple at Seniseng quest for not only the Ancient mag Magics, but also you will get the uh, Curses as well. And as for my gear setup, as you can see I have the Inquisitor Staff. I'm also using Virtus, uh, the body and the legs. And then I do have some crystal gear. I'm using the crystal helm, uh, boots, and gloves. And um, that will allow me to have sort of a passive effect on the crystal shapeshifters. Um, three uh, of the crystal gear slots, they give me the Tardian Fury ability. I will be able to use that. And basically it is just a damage buff against crystal shapeshifters. For my inventory, I have the Holy Overloads and the Super Restores. Um, I do recommend using a Ripper Demon as well. And having some uh, magic note paper would be helpful just so you can note some of the Rune Salvage that will be dropped. Um, and then just some Emergency Shark. Also a Spring Cleaner would be helpful here as well. Um, and uh, for this method, 
Um, you could use the Vampirism Aura, that is a really great option, or you could also use the Penance Aura, so you won't have to use the Super Restores, and it'll make it a little bit more AFK. So using this setup, um, first off, you will need to go to a uh, sunken pyramid with crystal shapeshifters inside. Mine only has three crystal shapeshifters. However, if you do have four or five, that definitely is doable, especially if you're using the Vampirism Aura. But for this, since I only have three, I am going to be using the Penance Aura, which will allow me to replenish some of my prayer points. So basically, this method, you are going to want to be using the Blood Barrage and make sure that you are using Soul Split and Torment. With the Penance Aura, you'll basically be at unlimited prayer points. Um, and the only thing you need to watch out for is your health. I do find that if I do not have an Overload active, then my health sort of does end up dwindling um, and I could actually be killed. The Crystal Shapeshifters, they are a pretty strong creature, so you do need to watch out for that. Um, and just be cautious on your health. With three Crystal Shapeshifters and an Overload active, you really don't have any problem. Usually you're around max health. Uh, but if the Overload isn't active, then sometimes you might see your health quite low. So the main thing for this method is make sure that those Overloads are always active. In terms of the loot that you are going to be getting from Crystal Shapeshifters, they do offer a lot of notables, so notable herbs, um, and they also do have the Tardian Crystals. Now, you can go to Tardian and exchange these with Angoff, and you will be able to get some crystal gear, which then can be sold on the Grand Exchange or Alked. Basically, each crystal is worth at least 2,000 coins, um, and you are going to be getting a lot of your profit from these crystals, so make sure that you are picking them up. Um, aside from that, uh, the rest of the drops mostly are notable. They also will have some Rune Salvage, that you might need to pick up. Um, but uh, yeah, this method is fully AFK. Um, the Crystal Shapeshifters, they are aggressive too if you do turn that uh, option on when talking to Angoff, um, and you, meaning you don't need to use any aggression potions. Um, so that uh, is really nice about this method. Um, and yeah, that is basically it for this method. You can make up to 10 mil per hour doing it, especially if you have the four or five crystal shapeshifters in the dungeon. And so next we have Gathering Calcified Fungus at the Croesus Front. This method only has one requirement being 88 mining. However, 92 mining will allow you to mine the enriched calcified fungus, which is worth a little bit more. So you would want to have 92 mining if possible. Also recommended is the Magic Golem outfit, the Dwarven Ram Hammer, Sign of the Porters, and just any other boost that will help you with mining. So this is specifically a skilling money making method. Uh, however, if you do use the Dwarven Ram Hammers, you can double the amount of resources you will be gathering, but you won't be getting any XP. So there is a bit of a trade-off there. If you want to go for the most GP per hour, you can use the Dwarven Ram Hammer. If not, you can still make some money, but also train mining at the same time. And so although the Grand Exchange price of the Calcified Fungus is quite low, they are selling for a lot of GP per hour. As you can see, the regular calcified fungus is selling for around 8,600 coins each, whereas the enriched calcified fungus, which is the fungus you will be gathering on the uh, corpse that is shiny, those are worth around 12k each right now. So overall, doing this method, you should be able to make around 4 mil per hour. It is somewhat AFK. With mining, you do need to keep your stamina up if you are trying to get the highest amount of GP per hour. But aside from that, it is fairly AFK. So starting off with our first method, we have screening soil. Specifically, we will be screening earth and clay. That is the best soil to screen at this very moment. Now, doing this method, you will require the archaeology soil box. There isn't really an archaeology level that is required to screen soil. However, the earthen clay does require level 76 archaeology. But 99 archaeology is highly recommended, and that is so you will be able to buy the master archaeologist outfit. This is extremely important for this method since it will decrease the time it takes to 
uh, screen one soil from 1.8 seconds all the way down to 1.2 seconds. So this will allow you to screen 3000 soil per hour if you do have this outfit. So it is highly recommended. I also recommend the Grace of the Elves and the Water Fiend Familiar just to boost your GP per hour a little bit. Now, doing this method, you will get two minutes of AFK time, meaning you will need to click the screen or do something every two minutes at least. Um, and then also, you will get 60,000 archaeology XP per hour while doing this method, as well as five to six mil GP per hour. So this method is pretty straightforward and simple. You will want to buy some earth and clay on the Grand Exchange and then summon your Water Fiend Familiar and get the gear set up and then you'll just head to the screening station and start screening the soil. You'll see that you will get two minutes of AFK time whenever you are screening this soil. Um, again, it does depend on which soil box you do have. If you do have the final upgrade and you can hold the 500 soil, then you will get that two minutes of AFK time five times before you have to just head over to the bank and fill up your soil box again. As I mentioned, you will be able to screen 3000 soil per hour and the profit from this method is going to be coming from the materials that you are getting from screening the soil. Now, I do recommend the Grace of the Elves and charging it with the sign of porters is really helpful. It makes it much more AFK. Um, and you will also uh, be able to transport all of the materials straight to the bank um, or the deposit box in this case. So I did test this method with 1000 soil, meaning 20 minutes of work. And as you can see, I did collect about 3.7 mil in materials from doing this. Now this was in 20 minutes, so if I multiply it by, by three, that is 6.65 million GP per hour. However, again, you are going to be using some sign of the porters if you are choosing that part of the method. It does make it a bit more AFK and you'll get materials slightly faster per hour. Um, and based on this, you will be spending about 1.8 mil per hour just on the sign of porters, meaning the GP per hour is right around 5 mil per hour. Of course, it does depend on what materials you are getting, um, and there is a bit of RNG for that, um, but overall, you can expect at least around five mil per hour from this method. For method number two, we have smelting necronium bars. The only requirement is level 77 smithing, so this is more of a mid-tier method, and it is also pretty good. You're able to make about five mil GP per hour, as well as gain 50,000 smithing XP per hour, and you will be AFK for about a minute to a minute and a half at a time. Now there are some recommendations for this method. Um, one is the smelting gauntlets. They're highly recommended. It will allow you to um, basically smelt 60 bars at once and they will go straight towards your metal bank. If you don't have them, you can only smelt 28 and they will go into your inventory. So the smelting gauntlets are highly recommended and you get them from the Family Crest quest. The Light Within is highly recommended for the Super Heat Form Prayer. It will allow you to smelt these bars much faster. And aside from these two recommendations, the rest aren't as important. Of course, the Augmented Crystal Hammer will help, as well as the Orthon Furnace Core, since it will make it so you don't need any prayer points uh, when you are using the uh, Super Heat Form Curse. The Modified Blacksmith's Helmet is also helpful, as well as the Grace of the Elves. So to start this method, you will want to head to a furnace. Of course, you will want the recommended gear, which is the smelting gauntlets. These are highly recommended. It makes it much more AFK. Also, you will want to be using an augmented crystal hammer if you do have one. The orthon furnace core is helpful, as well as the modified blacksmith's helmet. Um, and you can also use the Grace of the Elves and Ancient Ritual Shard. You will want to be using the Superheat Form Curse just to make it so you will be smithing faster. If you do have the Orthon Furnace Core, it won't use any prayer points. Otherwise, you will need to bring some sort of prayer restore, um, like a prayer renewal potion. So to start, you will want to deposit all of your ores into the metal bank and just smelt on the smelter and you're just going to be smelting the necronium bars. 
Now the key with this method is that with level 77 smithing you will have a chance at creating double the bars. So you will have about a 10% chance to do this as you can see and this is where most of the profit does come from because off the bat you are making a bit of profit about a 700 GP profit margin um, but with this extra 10% it really does boost it another 800 GP per bar which is where a good chunk of the profit does come from. So you can expect to make right around 5 mil per hour doing this method and it is quite AFK as you can see. You will be getting about a minute and a half of AFK time uh, before you have to start clicking again. And so moving on to our next method, we have crafting the Dragonstone Bracelets. There is only one requirement for this method, which is level 74 crafting. Also recommended is the Family Crest quest. If this quest is completed, you will be able to use the golden bars inside the bank interface. If it isn't completed, then you will need to basically have an inventory of 14 dragonstones and 14 gold bars. So you won't be able to use them in the uh, furnace interface. Uh, so this is really helpful because it will allow you to make more of the dragonstone bracelets per hour. And it also does make it much more AFK. So speaking of AFK, you will get 50 seconds of AFK time every time you start crafting these. So not too much time, but the GP and XP per hour is really good for this method. You will be making around 5 mil GP per hour, which is really great, along with 170,000 crafting XP per hour. Now the best place to do this is actually in Shiloh Village, but there are some requirements in order to um, make it there. Now, the Edgeville Bank, it is only a few seconds slower, so I'm going to show you the method using the Edgeville Bank. However, Shiloh Village is slightly faster. So what you're going to be doing is creating some Dragonstone bracelets. So in the smelting interface, you will be going to the gold bar section. And as you can see, you can create either the Dragonstone necklace, bracelet, or amulet, since I do have the Dragonstones in my inventory. Now the Dragonstone necklaces, they are actually quite profitable as well. You can go with them. Um, the Dragonstone bracelets do give slightly more XP um, and the GP per hour is very similar. So you can sort of choose um, which one to go with. Sometimes one won't sell over the other, um, but they should typically sell quite often, especially Dragonstone necklaces since they are used for Sign of the Porters. So we're going to go with the Dragonstone Bracelets. As you can see, you're AFK for about 45-50 seconds. Then you will need to go back to the bank and get more cut Dragonstones um, to make more of the Dragonstone Bracelets. So for this method, you are going to be making right around 4 to 5 mil per hour. And the XP, as I mentioned, is quite good as well at about 170,000 crafting XP per hour. So overall, this is a really great money-making method, and it is a bit AFK as well, but it's also a pretty good crafting uh, training method as well that you can use um, if you're looking to train crafting and make some GP at the same time. And moving on to our next method, we have another sort of low or mid-level AFK money-making method for you guys, which is doing AFK Chaos Dwarves and Chaos Cannoneers. So there is only one requirement being forgiveness of a Chaos Dwarf. Also recommended is 70 Defense, 75 Magic, the Bone Crusher, and the Demon Horn Necklace, or the Twisted Bird Skull Necklace. For the gear setup, I recommend using some non-degrading magic armor. So as you can see, I am using Subjugation, as well as the Armadil Battle Staff. You can use a really weak spell, so the Armadil Battle Staff is perfect because it does give you unlimited air runes. Um, so I would recommend sort of something like that. Also, if you do have the Scavenging Perk, this is an excellent spot to use that Scavenging Perk. So if you do have some armor with it on, this is an awesome method to do it. You will be getting a lot of kills per hour, and therefore you will be getting a lot of invention components as well. In terms of the magic XP per hour, you will get about 60k magic XP per hour, and you will be able to be AFK for about 4 minutes at a time. 
As you can see in the bottom left, those are going to be the main drops that you're going to be looking out for. The hand cannon is a 1 in 132 drop, and it is worth right around 450k. And then of course you do have the dragon pickaxe, which is a 1 in 5,000 drop, worth right around 19 mil. So the Chaos Dwarves and Hand Cannoneers are located in Keldegrim. They will be located in the crevice, as you can see I am going there right now. And you can teleport quickly to Keldegrim if you do have a Luck of the Dwarves ring. So in this room you will find the Chaos Dwarves and Hand Cannoneers. They won't attack you at, at first, but once you do start attacking them, especially if you are using abilities like Chain and Dragon Breath, you will get some uh, Chaos Dwarves becoming aggro onto you. That way you won't need to use any aggression potion since that will heavily cut into your profit per hour. This method you are mostly going to be looking out for those big drops being the hand cannons and the dragon pickaxe. So you will need to keep your eye open for one of those. I recommend setting your loot beam to something around 400k. That way you will be able to see um, if you do get one of those drops just by seeing if you got a loop beam or not But yeah aside from that that is it for this method It is quite simple and you will just be looking out for that drop again It won't make you as much GP per hour um, But it is pretty AFK and if you do have that scavenging perk It will give you some pretty good invention components on the side as well So we're gonna start by looking at the requirements and recommendations so first, the requirements, uh, 70 constitution is required to kill Krill. Also, you will need the troll st stronghold completed, at least partial completion to access the God Wars dungeon. Um, for the AFK method, you will require the demon horn necklace and the attuned ectoplasmeter. Now, these aren't required to kill Krill. However, it is necessary for this AFK method that I am going to be showing you guys. So for the Demon Horn Necklace, this can be purchased with 35,000 Dungeoneering Tokens. However, it also does require level 90 Prayer and level 90 Dungeoneering to wear. If you don't have level 90 Prayer or level 90 Dungeoneering, you can also use the Split Dragon Tooth Necklace, which is basically just a weaker version of the necklace. So this would require level 60 Prayer and level 60 Dungeoneering. Essentially what these necklaces are for, they are going to allow you to gain Prayer Points, when you do bury some of the uh, infernal ashes which you will be getting after each kill. Um, so in combination with the attuned ectoplasmeter, this is a really good combo. Um, the demon horn necklace will allow you to regain 150 prayer points per infernal ash while the split dragon tooth necklace restores 100 prayer points. Now using this with the attuned ectoplasmeter is super effective because it will automatically scatter the ashes after each kill. Now you can obtain the attuned ectoplasmeter by creating it um, using 100 ghostly essence and the regular ectoplasmeter. Um, the regular ectoplasmeter is a drop from ghosts. It is a very rare drop, so um, if you guys don't have it, it might be fairly difficult to obtain. Um, however, you will get it over time if you are just doing Slayer and just killing ghosts in general. Anyway, moving on to the recommended stats. We have 80 plus magic at least, also having overloads is really helpful for this method, and curses is really helpful for the AFK method as well. So now taking a look at the inventory setup, um, I did highlight some of the most important items as I mentioned, the demon horn necklace and the attuned ectoplasmeter are probably the most important items. Um, now also the penance aura, I find this is the best aura to use. Um, because you will be regaining prayer points as you are fighting the boss. Essentially, this will give you unlimited prayer points with the Attune Ectoplasmeter and Demon Horn Necklace regaining uh, prayer points from scattering those ashes. Um, with the addition of the Penance Aura, you basically have unlimited prayer, which makes this method really AFK. Alternatively, if you don't have the Penance Aura or you would like to use a different one, um, you can switch it out. Um, another good one is Vampirism Aura. It will regain some health, which is also really great. Um, but even if you don't have the Penance Aura active, you will almost have Unlimited Prayer. You will need to bring one or two prayer pots just for emergencies. However, the Demon Horn Necklace will almost give you max prayer if you are using Soul Split, as well as Torment. As you can see in my staff slots, I do have the Inquisitor's Staff. This is 
effective against Krill since Krill is a melee uh, based boss. You will get the uh, damage buff for the Inquisitor's Staff. Now if you don't have this, it isn't really an issue. You can just use your best magic weapon. Noctra's Staff works really well. Um, you could also use tier 80 or 85 uh, magic weapons also. For the gear, you want to make sure that you don't have really high level gear because Krill is a pretty easy boss to kill, so you want to minimize some of those costs. As you can see, I'm just using Subjugation. I also have my Pernix body on, um, and this is because it is augmented and has the Venom Blood perk. Krill will poison you, so having the Venom Blood perk is super helpful um, because the uh, poison will take away your life points and it will just... Uh, make this method a little bit less AFK, you'll need to really watch your health a little bit more frequently if you don't have this. In my room pouch, as you can see, I have my air, fire, and blood runes. I'm going to be using blood barrage since that also does heal you a little bit, and it is a really high magic spell. So just use the strongest magic spell you can. Um, blood barrage is a really great one just because it does have that healing effect as well. As for my action bar, you can use something somewhat similar to mine as you can see I do have sunshine right at the start of the bar I am using full revolution allowing my ultimate abilities and threshold to be activated automatically as well um, so with this action bar it is really great for AFKing because you won't need to use any abilities basically the only thing you need to do for this method is going to be picking up the drops and renewing your overloads aside from that it is going to be fully AFK which is really awesome uh, as I mentioned, you are going to be getting some boss kills, some marks of war, as well as a decent 4 to 5 mil per hour. So now moving on to the actual kill, uh, I just want to show you guys that this is fully AFK. I'm literally not going to touch a thing for a few minutes here, and you guys are going to see that my health stays really high. Sometimes it does get below about uh, 5,000, that is because Krill does have a special attack. If you are using prayers or curses, and that special attack can deal 4 or 5,000 damage. However, you will heal up to 10,000 with Soul Split active um, before he does use that special attack again. Doing this method will allow you to kill about 60 Krill per hour, which is really great. Um, and as I have mentioned, it will get you about 4 to 5 mil per hour. Um, Krill's drops, they are worth quite a bit right now, actually. All of Krill's unique drops, aside from the Steam Battle Staff and the God Sword Shards, are all worth over 1 mil each. So you will be able to make quite a bit of money off of just those unique drops. But also Krill does drop some Wine of Zamrock. This is an uncommon drop. Um, the generals in here also do drop this as well. And you will get 2-10 to 10 Wine of Zamrock per time. They're worth about 12k each at this very moment. So you are going to be making a lot of money off of those. Um, and of course it does drop some coins, um, some noted herbs as well, which you will be able to make a decent bit of money off of. Now also I do want to mention another really useful uh, thing that you can have for this method is the Persistent Rage Relic. Um, as you guys saw, after you do kill Krill, um, you are out of combat for a little bit and your adrenaline will drain a little bit. So if you do have Persistent Rage, um, it will allow it... Um, to make this method a little bit more AFK, you won't need to stall your adrenaline, you'll be able to just let it run, um, and you won't lose that adrenaline speeding up on your kill times. And also another thing that I would like to mention is that when Krill does spawn, if you do want to make this method a little bit faster, you might want to make sure you are attacking Krill um, at the start of each encounter. That is because you can auto-retaliate onto some of the uh, generals, and this will essentially just make your kill times a lot longer, lowering your kills per hour. So if you guys do make sure that you are attacking Krill right at the start when he spawns, that will speed up your kill times, allowing you to get those 60 kills per hour. Anyway guys, that is basically it for this method. It is a really simple one actually, and you can make some pretty good money off of it, as well as get some of those unique drops, which is always pretty exciting. So we're going to start off by taking a look at the requirements and recommendations. So first off, level 70 range is required to encounter Krayara. Um, also, you will require a partial completion of the Troll Stronghold. 
Also, some requirements for this AFK method include the Demon Horn Necklace, the Bone Crusher, and the Penance Aura. These are all necessary if you're looking at doing this AFK method effectively. Um, you will, of course, be able to kill Krayara without these three. However, just for this AFK method, they are pretty much necessary. Also recommended is 80 plus ranged. Also, overloads and curses are highly recommended. It will definitely help your kill times. And also curses if you do have soul split as well as anguish. This will help a lot, um, especially the soul split, just because you will need to be able to heal the health back. So just try and have curses with at least 92 prayers so you will have that. Now let's take a look at the gear setup. So as you can see, I'm using Anima Core of Zamorak. You could use Armadil Armor as well if you were looking to save on costs. Um, however, I really like using this armor. It is perked out a little bit, so I do get that as well. Um, as you can see, the most important items I did highlight, so I am using the Penance Aura. Um, this will allow me to regain prayer points while I am fighting this boss. Also, the Demon Horror Necklace does this as well, because every time a bone is dropped, um, my Bone Crusher will crush it, and I'll get 50 prayer points back every bone. So this is going to help regain my prayer as well. Um, you could also switch your Penance Aura with the Vampirism Aura. Um, this will, however, make it so that you will not gain prayer as effectively, so you might need to bring a little bit more prayer potions. However, you will be gaining a lot more uh, life points back, so you won't need to worry at, on that aspect of things. Um, for my ranged weapon, I am using the Saren God Bow. Of course, you can use a weaker weapon. This is a tier 92 weapon. Um, also, the spec is really good against Krayar as well. But uh, you could use a Noxious Longbow, you could use Ascension Crossbows, um, any kind of weapon would work, preferably tier 80 or above. Um, I'm also using the Nightmare Gauntlets, this will help with my snipe ability. Um, as you can see it is pretty far in the action bar, but you could move it up if you do have the Nightmare Gauntlets. Um, if not, you can use any other type of ranged gear. Um, Armadil Gloves, they will work as well and it will save on costs a little bit. Looking in my inventory, I'm using the Enhanced Excalibur. This will allow me to restore some of my life points every five minutes. So this is really helpful to have. Also, a Spring Cleaner is super useful since Krayar will drop some Rune Salvage. So this will allow you to automatically disassemble that. I'm also bringing some Magic Note Peeper. There is some drops that Krayar does drop that you will want to note, um, including the Uniques. I like uh, noting those, especially if I get duplicates. Then of course I'm using my Holy Overloads, this will basically just speed up the kill and make it more AFK since I won't need to worry about my health points as much. I am bringing 5 Super Restores, however since I am using Penance Aura and the Demon Horn Necklace, I could lower on this, but if you only have one or the other, I would recommend bringing 4 or 5 of them. Um, then the rest of my inventory is filled out with food. I do find that I rarely need to eat any food, so you could leave some inventory space empty just to pick up the drops if you would like. Also, for your summoning familiar, it would be recommended if you do use a Ripper Demon or some sort of damaging familiar, the best one you got, um, because you probably won't need a Beast of Burden unless you are a lower level player, um, then you might need that extra bit of food. Um, but that is sort of up to you, um, whatever you would like to do there. You could also bring a pack yak with winter stored scrolls as an alternative to the magic note paper. This is also an option as well. Um, however, for this guide, I'm just bringing a pack mammoth with some extra food. Definitely could have used a ripper demon. Um, because that would obviously increase my damage per second. Looking at the action bar, this is my AFK ranged action bar. I like putting Death Swiftness in the first spot. Um, that way, if I ever do have 100% Adrenaline, I am going to be using this ability. And next, the following abilities include Rapid Shot, Bombardment. I also have Corruption Shot and Piercing Shot. Um, these are nice AoE abilities to have. Then I also have Dazing Shot, Sacrifice, Fragmentation Shot. Binding Shot and Rapid Fire, following by Snipe and Tight Bindings. Um, you can mix this around a little bit, but I would highly recommend having uh, Death Swiftness and Rapid Shot right at the start. And also using some AoE abilities is pretty helpful as well, since it will help kill the minions. Now, let's look at some of the mechanics from the Krayara fight. So first off, Krayara will attack in ranged if you are attacking it. And its range attack is a bit unique, so every time it will hit you with a range attack, it will actually move your player one space. 
So because of this, I recommend standing in one of the corners of the room. I found that the corner closest to the door actually works the best, because sometimes he can sort of go to the side of you and still move you a little bit, um, which is a bit annoying, so you might need to correct that. But you do just want to make sure that you are in one of these corners. This is really helpful because also it won't uh, allow, cancel any of your abilities like your rapid fire or your snapshot if you don't have the nightmare gauntlets on. Um, so definitely make sure to try and stay in one of these corners. Also, as you can see, I am praying uh, soul split as well as using anguish just to maximize my DPS. Now also, as you can see, I am not really touching anything. I'm just allowing the fight to start up myself. So um, if you can see, I actually attack some of the minions first um, every few encounters, which does slow my kill time. So if you are looking to speed it up a little bit, you can click on Krayara whenever he spawns just to start attacking him first, because that is what you are going to want to do. You'll take a lot less damage this way. And of course, your kill times will be the fastest. So it is a little bit more active and it does make the method a little bit less AFK. But uh, if you want to do that, um, that will speed up the kills per hour and, of course, make you a little bit more GP per hour. Um, another tip with this method, um, if you can see in between kills, I actually do lose adrenaline. So if you do have the Persistent Rage Relic, which you can get from Archaeology, this relic allows you to not drain any adrenaline outside of combat. This is an extremely helpful relic for any AFK boss creature, including Krayara. Um, so I would highly recommend you guys use this if you do have it or if you can obtain it. Aside from that, that is basically it for this boss fight. As you can see, I am just renewing my holy overloads whenever those are done and picking up the drops um, every minute or so after every few kills. And that really is basically it. Using this method, you should be able to kill around 50 Krayara per hour, um, which will make you around 5 mil per hour. All of Krayara's unique drops are priced really high, anywhere from 3 up to 9.5 mil if you do get the armadillo chest plate. So you are going to be making most of your money off of these unique drops. And they are priced so high because of their invention components. The armadillo components, they're really useful for making devoted and the precise perk, which are really good perks to have. Um, so for that reason, um, the price on all of these items are really high and they will probably stay pretty high. Um, but this boss is an exceptional AFK moneymaker, as I mentioned. You not only get the 5 mil GP per hour, but you'll also get some of the marks of war as well. And you do have a chance at a boss pet. So it is a ton of fun to do. So starting off with the first daily moneymaking method, we have buying feathers. Now there aren't any requirements for this method, but there are quite a few recommendations which will unlock other shops that will be selling feathers therefore you will be increasing your profit with each of these recommended items so first off you can do this in about eight minutes of time and you can do it every 60 hours you won't get any xp from it because you are just going to be buying the feathers from the shop and then selling them later now you can make around 1.3 mil every time you do this so every 60 hours which is pretty good GP per hour, especially in terms of doing it for only eight minutes. If you do calculate that as effective profit per hour, you are making right around nine to 10 mil GP per hour. Now there are various different uh, shop locations that you will want to go to. I have listed this in the order of which you should be going to the shop. So first off, there is a shop in Lumbridge. There's also one in Port Serum. Then you'll want to head to Al Karid. Um, this shop is in the Shanty Pass. Drainer Manor has another shop, but you must complete Animal Magnetism. The Fishing Guild requires 68 fishing. The Fremenic Province requires the Fremenic Trials Quest. You'll then want to go to the shops in Etceteria, Miscellanea, and then Uglog, which does require the As a First Resort quest. Also, you can go to Menifos, which requires the Jack of the Trades quest. And then, of course, Shiloh Village, which requires the Shiloh Village quest. Now, the next method I have is buying runes. Now, there are no requirements for this method either, and there are quite a few recommendations. Now, again, the recommendations are just to unlock more shops, so you will be able to have a higher GP per hour or GP per instance for each of these recommended items. 
Now, first off, you will take about 12 minutes to complete this, and you can do it every 24 hours. Now, you are making some pretty good profit from this. You're making right around 3 million coins every time you do this, and you can do it every 24 hours. Now, if you were to calculate that as per GP per hour, it's effectively 15 mil per hour, so it is an excellent daily method to do. Now again, there are 11 rune shops around RuneScape which you will want to buy runes from. Uh, first off, when you do make it to these shops, some runes are profitable and some are not. Currently, you will want to avoid buying the Mind runes, the Chaos runes, the Nature runes, Law runes, and Death runes. So you will not want to buy any of those. Now again, you will want to go through this list that I have on screen. First off is the Mage of Zamrock, which does require the Abyss mini quest. Then you'll want to go to the Mage Arena, then Burthorpe, Varrock, Alcarid if you do have the Rogue Trader quest completed. You'll then want to go to Port Serum, the Void Knight Outpost, Yanil Magic Guild if you have 66 magic. You'll then want to go to the Lunar Island if you have Lunar Diplomacy, and note that the uh, Lunar Island does offer the most GP, um, so you will definitely want to hit up this shop because it does sell soul runes. There's also Apatol if you have Monkey Madness completed, and Anachronia if you have the level 3 Town Hall upgraded. Now moving on to our next method, we have Charging Inert Adrenaline Crystals. Now the only requirement is level 93 herb lore, and recommended is the scroll of cleansing just to have that unlocked. Now you will be able to get about 24k herb lore XP if you do not use the herb lore cape, but the GP per hour is what you're going to be looking for for this method, and you'll be getting this by using the herb lore cape. So you will be able to make around 13 mil per instance, which is about 60 minutes of time if you did buy up all of the inert adrenaline crystals. And you should be able to do this every 24 hours. So the main reason why you have to wait 24 hours is because there is a buy limit on the inert adrenaline crystals. You can only buy 500 every four hours. And you should be able to do right around 2,000 to 2,400 of these every hour. Meaning it will take you a full 24 hours to buy all of the inert adrenaline crystals. So to do this method you will want to stock up on the inert adrenaline crystals. And when charging these inert adrenaline crystals it will require one of them plus primal extract and a spark of chitin. So you will want to make a preset with this set up um, and then of course use a portable well and you should be able to do right around 2,300 or so per hour depending on how fast you are doing it which will equate to right around 13 mil per hour um, give or take just depending on the profit you are getting. But as you can see right now as of current prices you are making about 4,700 GP every time you are charging one of these crystals, which is really awesome. And so for the next method, we have cleaning herbs. The requirement for this method is 99 herb lore for that herb lore cape. It's going to allow you to clean an insane amount of herbs per hour. For this method, you're going to be gaining right around 24K herb lore XP per hour. You don't really get much from cleaning the herbs. And as for the time for this method, you can do it for 11 minutes every 4 hours. Um, and that is just because of the buy limit for the herbs. Of course, you could switch to another one after that 11 minutes. Um, or you could even stockpile herbs and do them all at once. The only recommendation is lots of cash. And you will be buying and selling on the Grand Exchange, so make sure that the profit margins are there. As you can see in this table that I got from the wiki, it says the highest profit margin is the Atlantidime, but of course, check on the Grand Exchange before you buy a ton of them and clean them because um, the profit margins may vary a little bit. So when doing this method, it is really important to check the prices um, just to make sure that the margins are there because of course, for this method, you are going to be buying and selling on the Grand Exchange and prices will always vary a little bit. Um, so as you can see, Lantadime was the best on the graph in terms of profit margin. 
but uh, it actually is the uh, dwarf weed right now just because the prices are a little bit off uh, for the Grand Exchange. So I will be cleaning the dwarf weed. Now the first thing for this method, you will want to make sure um, that you set up a preset. Now the other thing with this method is that you are going to want to use your herb lore cape and you're gonna wanna have it on your action bar. That way you can just activate it. So if I click R for example, it automatically uh, cleans all of the herbs in my inventory. So I can go in, hit the uh, button for the preset, and basically you're just going to continually do this over and over. Now one thing to note about the method, you aren't getting any XP if you are using the Herblore Cape. You can do the method without the Herblore Cape, and you will get a little bit of XP from it. Um, but if you want to clean the most amount of herbs per hour, you will want to use this Herblore Cape, and that's really the only way this method is going to be a viable moneymaker. And for the next method, we have Divine Locations. So right now, there are three Divine Locations which are quite competitive in terms of the profit. Um, however, this does vary as always because prices on the Grand Exchange do change. Um, so first off, the Divine Tree, which can actually be done at level 7 Divination. You're just going to be getting regular logs, which are priced at over 1,000 GP per log, which is quite crazy. Um, so you can make some pretty good money off of this. You're only going to be getting around 250k at most per in instance. Um, and you will be getting a little bit of XP from it. Um, so that is a good thing about this. Um, of course, it does depend on which divine location you are using. And it will only take right around 2 minutes um, every 24 hours. So it is a pretty quick and fast money maker. And then you also get a bit of XP as well. I do recommend doing this method on World 2 at Berthorpe. You'll usually find quite a few other people around here, um, and you might uh, find some other people using Divine Locations as well. And if you do have someone jump in, you will get some more uh, resources, so that is pretty helpful. And so the next daily moneymaker is Farm Runs. And there are some requirements. It depends on uh, what herb you are going to be farming. Um, so I will show you that in the next slide. But recommended is the Magic Secateurs. They will allow you to harvest more herbs. Um, also the Scroll of Life, Juju Farming Potions, Green Fingers Aura, and the Master Farming Outfit. These are all going to in increase your output of herbs um, when you are doing these farm runs. You'll be getting around 2k to 30k XP per farm run depending on the herb and it should only take you about five minutes and you can also do it every 100 minutes and this will make you right around 1 to 1.2 mil GP per instance so per five minutes you can see that it is a really excellent money maker so there is a total of seven herb patches three of them are locked behind some requirements um, but you do have the uh, farm patch north of Port Serum, uh, the Port Phasmidus uh, herb patch, the Catherby and Ardone herb patch, and those will be accessible to everyone. You'll also have the uh, Troll Stronghold farm patch, which is locked behind My Big Arms Adventure, Priftinus, which requires Plague's End, and then there is one in the wilderness, um, but it can only grow Bloodweed. Now, as you can see in the chart here, um, I did list some of the better herbs to um, plant in terms of net profit. Now, I would recommend doing the spirit weeds as the best one just because the seeds cost so little and you are making about 14k profit per herb. Um, so there isn't really any risk to this, especially if you don't have all of the boosts to get the maximum herb output when you are harvesting, um, then the spirit weed is by far the best. So that's what I would recommend for most players right now. So basically you will want to be going to each of these herb patches and planting your herbs there, um, and then also harvest them after 100 minutes um, to make your profit. It is a pretty straightforward method. Um, it does become a bit tedious, but it is an excellent daily moneymaker, or even a moneymaker you can do every hour and a half, basically, to make some nice extra cash. 
Now the next method is making back criminal bolts and it does have some fairly high requirements in 85 wood cutting and 93 fletching. Now you can do this for 12 minutes approximately and you can do it every 24 hours. Recommended you will want Nomad's Requiem completed, the Ritual of Maharet, the Branches of Dark Mire, Plague's End, and 95 Dungeoneering. Now you will be able to make right around 3 mil per instance while you are making back criminal bolts. Um, if you do the whole run, um, you will make a little bit more and it will take a bit longer. So there are eight different locations where you can chop down the bloodwood trees and then also make the back criminal bolts. So first off, you will need to buy the back criminal bolt tips from Mammy Rimba in the northwest uh, area of Edgeville. Um, you will be able to then go to each of these bloodwood trees and chop them down. You'll get uh, basically bloodwood logs, which can then be fletched into back criminal bolt shafts. Then you'll make the back criminal bolts with the back criminal bolt tips. Now, typically, I only go to the three wilderness locations. You'll actually get more bloodwood logs on average from these locations because they are located in the wilderness. But if you do have the following requirements, then you can go to the other locations as well. So there is one at the Manor Farm. Um, you will need 225,000 farming reputation. The Soul Wars uh, Bloodwood Tree requires Nomad's Requiem. Ritual Plateau requires the Ritual of Maharet. The Bloodwood Tree in Darkmire requires the Branches of Darkmire quest. And the Goraja Resource Dungeon requires Plague's End and 95 Dungeoneering. Now, uh, you can go to each of these trees. You will be able to chop them down for the Bloodwood Logs. Note that you cannot walk away from the trees before you fletch the logs, um, or else they will turn into dust. So you need to make the full back criminal bolts at that tree before you leave. So for the next method, we have making potion flasks. Now there are some requirements, including 89 crafting, 81 mining, and as a first resort quest. Also recommended is the resourceful aura. If you have it, it will give you a 10% chance to give you an additional uh, red sandstone, which will not contribute to your daily limit. Now you can do this method every 24 hours, and it should only take around 7 minutes. You'll be making around 1.3 mil profit in those 7 minutes. So to make these potion flasks, you will want to start by mining the red sandstone just outside of Uglog, and you will be able to mine 50 of these per day. Now you can also mine an additional 25 from the Sophenum Red Sandstone, um, which is east of Sophenum or north of the Camel Warriors Island, um, after completion of the Elite Desert Achievements. Now typically I only mine the Red Sandstone here at Uglog just because it is more simple and I don't have the Elite Desert Achievements completed, um, but you will be able to make that 1 mil per hour-ish um, just by doing the Uglog location, especially if you have the resource full aura. Now, once you get a full inventory of the red sandstone, you'll want to go over to the robust glass machine, and here you'll make the robust glass. You can then craft it to make the potion flasks. You should be able to do about two inventories of this, um, and then you'll have to wait another day before you can do it again. Now, moving on to the next method, we have probably the most iconic daily moneymaker um, that I can think of, which is making Vizwax. The only requirement is 50 rune crafting, so a pretty low requirement, and you can make 1 mil in just 2 minutes of work every day. Also recommended is the rune crafting cape with 99 rune crafting. This will help you uh, get more Vizwax every day, so if you do have that, it is quite helpful. So now I want to explain how the Rune Goldberg machine specifically works. So there is a maximum amount of Vizwax you can obtain per day. This maximum amount is 100, and you will get 30 Vizwax from the first slot, 30 from the second slot, and 40 from the third slot. 
Now also everyone has the same rune combination for the first slot in the rune Goldberg machine. There are also some parentheses beside the uh, rune in the first slot. These are basically the highest amount for cheaper runes. And I will show you this in a little bit when I go into my Discord server and show you how to actually figure out the combinations. Um, but anyway, the second slot, it will have a possibility of being three different runes. And then the third slot, it is random for everyone. And it can be known using the rune crafting cape. So and now I'm going to go into how to actually find this combination. So first off, if you are in my Discord server, you can just scroll down to the Vizwax channel in the bots tab. So here you will see that there is going to be a combination posted each day. Today it is Cosmic Runes in slot number one, and then we also have Air, Body, and Chaos in slot number two. Now you will also notice that there are some parentheses here. So in slot number one, Cosmic Runes, basically they will give you 30 Vizwax. Now if you do put Water Runes in slot number one, they'll give you 23 out of the 30. If you put air, they'll give you 25 out of 30, and law will give you 28 out of 30. So after you have checked the Rune Goldberg combinations through my Discord or through the forums, then you are now ready to make the Vizwax. So if you do have the Wicked Hood, you can teleport straight to the top of the Wizard's Tower. If not, um, you'll just want to run there. Just get to the top of the Wizard's Tower and enter the Runecrafting Guild, which is the middle portal. Now, once you are here, you are going to notice the Rune Goldberg machine is just a little bit to the east. Um, you can interact with it, and this is where you are going to be putting your runes in each slot. So, as you guys can remember, slot number one was Cosmic Runes, and then slot number two was either Air, Chaos, or Body Runes. So, I'm going to put um, Cosmic Runes in slot number one, and we're going to try out Air Runes for slot number two. Now, if you guys remember, for slot number three, we can figure this out by using the rune crafting cape. Um, so, as I, you can see, I activated the rune crafting cape, and it is mud runes for slot number three. If you guys don't have 99 rune crafting and don't have this cape, you won't be able to figure out the third slot. So, you will just have to put a random rune in and just try your luck to get the most Vizwax possible. So, trying out these combinations, I'm going to put cosmic, air, and then mud. So you can see we don't get the full 100 runes, so we know that the air rune is not the right one for slot number 2. Trying body, we know that that isn't right either, so it has to be chaos. Chaos has to be the rune where you get 30 vizwax. So you can see we're up to 100, we got each of the three combinations perfect. Now, say you didn't want to use cosmic runes in slot number 1, you could switch this out, for example, for air runes, and you'll get 25 out of the 30 for that slot, so in total you will be getting 95 Vizwax. If you wanted to switch out the Chaos runes, you can see that Earth and Mind are in the parentheses after Chaos. So you switched Earth runes for that Chaos rune slot. You'll be getting 28 runes for that slot, so in total 98 out of the total 100. So that is basically how the rune Goldberg machine works. As for slot number 3 though, it is a bit different. You will not be able to figure out what the extra runes are that give you a lot of Vizwax in that slot, you only know the best rune. So for example, if you wanted to switch out the mud rune in slot number three, you won't be able to figure out what the other runes are. It is completely random. So even though it does take an earth and a water rune to make a mud rune, it doesn't mean that you are gonna be getting a lot of Vizwax from those specific runes. It is completely random as to how much Vizwax you are going to be getting. Um, but if you do get that third slot right, you definitely want to keep it um, because you are going to be getting 40 Vizwax out of that slot compared to 30 from each of the other two slots. And so next we have Managing Miscellanea. The only requirement for this is the Throne of Miscellanea quest and you can do this pretty fast. It only takes about two minutes and you can do it every 24 hours. Um, also recommended is the Royal Trouble quest. It will enhance the profit you will be making from this. You'll be making around 3 mil per week if you just spend that 2 minutes every day. So in total, that's only 14 minutes uh, per week, which isn't too long at all. And if you do calculate that into profit per hour, uh, you are going to be making you know, effectively 12 to 13 mil profit per hour from this. Now, for the Managing Miscellanea minigame, you will be allocating uh, your people 
from miscellanea to do different tasks and in turn they will be generating you some resources so right now to get the maximum profit you will want to maximize wood cutting and fishing however this does change so you may want to check the wiki to see what is best at the specific time you are doing this so to change the allocation you can talk to advisor grim in miscellanea uh, as you can see i want to maximize the wood and have half on fishing you get the extra few people if you do complete that royal trouble quest and here's what you can expect uh, from loot just from a few months of doing this as you can see it's about 19 mil um, so it is pretty easy to make quite a bit of money from this uh, and it is quite passive you just need to keep up the approval rating and also make sure there is also a bit of money in the coffers now as you can see you will have an approval rating and it will decrease over time so you will actually need to visit the city and make sure you prefer, perform some actions in the city to increase this approval rating so that's why what will be taking you the two minutes per day you just need to come to miscellanea which you can teleport using a luck of the dwarves ring and just perform some actions i highly recommend mining the coal since it is afk you don't get anything in your inventory and doesn't deplete so um, this is the fastest way to get your approval up and it only takes a minute or two um, just to get it up uh, especially if it is quite high then it might even take less so you'll just need to do that uh, every day or every few days even and then when you go to collect your loot you will have quite a bit of loot accumulated for some pretty good profit and so next we have the alchemizer mk2 this is an invention machine that does require 108 invention you can use the alchemizer one as well However, it is quite a bit worse. The Alchemizer MK2 does not need to use any fire runes, so you will be making much more off of your Alks. Now, as you can see, I did list a table here of just some basic Alks that you can put into the machine. Basically, the Alchemizer MK2 will process up to 25 items every hour. Um, and you will make a bit of profit off of each of these Alks, even if you do buy it from the Grand Exchange. So you'll just need to find some items that are profitable when you do Alk them. And there are a ton of items that are profitable from Alking, such as Water Battle Staffs or Dragonstone Amulets, just things like that. Um, and all you need to do is put them in your Alchemizer MK2, charge it up with Nature Runes, and make sure you have... Uh, charges in the machine um, and then you'll be making profit just off of these alks now the next daily money maker is another invention machine which is the partial potion maker dx it does require 114 invention and it is actually quite passive i did list that it will uh, take you about two minutes every 24 hours but you can actually fill up the machine um, to process for 13 days and 13 hours uh, that's basically two weeks of passive time that uh, you will be making profit from this so basically with the partial potion maker you will need to fill it up with the herb and the vial of water so i did list some of the most profitable uh, unfinished potions that you can make with this potion maker and the top one right now being the Orgali Potion Unfinished. Of course, uh, this one is a bit of a different herb and it can be a bit illiquid at times. So I would probably base my profit off of the other one since they are quite consistent. So for the Clean Avento, for example, the profit from the machine will be about 934 coins per potion and it will process 40 of them per hour. Now, if you completely fill up this machine with 13,000 input items, you will be making that 934 profit per item, which actually ends up totaling about 12 million coins. So you can fill it up and it will do this over two weeks time nearly, and you will make 12 mil. So it is an exceptional money maker and it is extremely passive so if you do have the invention level i would highly recommend doing this method and so my next daily money maker is reaper tasks and a lot of you guys probably know this 
Um, but Reaper tasks are an exceptional daily money maker because the Reaper points are worth a ton. Right now, they're worth approximately 300k each, and you will be getting a minimum of seven Reaper points up to 37 Reaper points per task. That's anywhere from three to 11 mil per task, and that's not even including the drops you will be getting from the bosses as well. So this is an exceptional money maker, and you guys should take advantage for most days at least. Now, of course, this does require you to be competent at most bosses, and it will take about 30 minutes of time every hour about. Um, so there are some requirements to it, um, especially if you are looking to do uh, various different bosses, but it can also be a lot of fun. You know, bossing is one of the most popular activities in the game, and if you're someone who hasn't even gotten into bossing yet, uh, even trying out some lower level bosses like... Uh, Arch Glacier and normal mode and taking off some mechanics, it can be fun and it will get you in to uh, a different aspect of the game if you haven't tried it already. Not only that, if you are doing these bosses on Reaper tasks, you are going to be making a ton of money on top of having that chance at a unique drop. Now next we have selling player owned farm dragons. Now the requirements for this is upgrade your farm so that does allow the animals to breed in the breeding pen and also Kalia is highly recommended for at least part of this method. Now Kalia will actually store the extra unchecked animals from the breeding pen that are breeded in that breeding pen. So this will allow you to just go check with Kalia whenever you feel like and you'll have a bunch of unchecked dragons that you can then just go in ahead and sell on the Grand Exchange. So I did list it so you only have to be active two minutes every month for this method to work out. And you'll just need to go ahead and collect your dragons from Kalia whenever you are ready. From this, you can then just go ahead and sell them on the Grand Exchange for roughly two mil profit. Now, I want you to note that there are some variations to this method. There is another method where you can raise the unchecked black dragons to adult black dragons, and then you can take them out and sell them to actual players in the player-owned farm. Um, this is also a pretty good method as well, because people are buying adult black dragons, that way they can go ahead and just sell them for extra magical beans. So you can tweak this method a little bit to do that. If you decide to breed them into adult dragons, then you will be making a bit more profit per hour, um, but it will also be more frequent as well. And so with that, that concludes my ultimate money-making guide. In this guide, there was over 50 money-making methods, and I will try to update each of the methods in terms of GP per hour in the description down below periodically, so it does stay relevant. If you guys did enjoy the video, make sure to hit the thumbs up button and subscribe to the channel. It would be much appreciated. Anyway, guys, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you all in the next one. Peace.